think I got like 28 tattoos on my body. So I was like, you know what? That's and... also one thing we're going to ask you about. Because I, I, sh I saw all the tattoos. I remember you show your arms. Yeah, you yeah, show your not... arms to Ambassador Shao. I did. I'm gonna tell you a story about that too. Is it only you, or is, is Corsets coming as well, I or just you? Corsets coming. Corsets coming. Because I, like, she's got something that to deal with. Because oh, by the way, before we start, because we're going to have an emerging leader workshop, and you are welcome to join us. I'll be going. I'll be going. It's it's, it's in person, right? Yeah, it's in person. And I need, I need... right after that, we have the Papa 40th anniversary banquet. So this time around, it's going to, be, going to be in person too. And just so you know, we're going to have like the award ceremony going up too. I can't wait to go. I was waiting for the, I was waiting for uh, Papa to send me send me the invite. That way, I can take Tom off work in September. So I'm waiting okay. for that. Okay, yeah, sure. Because now we're just uh, trying to finalize the time, but we got it all set up right now. So for the emerging leader, it would be like from the eleven to sixteen, and on seventeen. That would be uh, on 70 in the morning. That would be like the starting day of the National Advocacy Conference. And for mm -hmm. that, we are actually planning to go to the Twin Oaks. And oh, in the evening, okay. would be like the 40th anniversary banquet. You so said 11 like the whole day celebration. Okay, so 11 for the 16th. Okay, and, and that's going to be in September, right? Yeah, they are all going to be on, in September. As a matter of fact, let me drop the calendar to you so it'd be easier for you to reference. All right, that way I can go because I, I really want to go. I really want to go to this so in person. It's true, and we like we can't wait to have everything back to in person. So this time right. around, we'll be like, we gotta do it big. Right. Don't yet. Yeah, right. So yeah, I'll be, I'll be there because I already told Janice, hey, I'm gonna be, I'm going this year. So. Oh, did you did you tell her about like did you tell her about like you like you also like look forward to like join the Imagine Leadership a workshop too? That that part that part I didn't tell her. Only thing I told only thing she told me about 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 it was like she told me that the whole event was like a weekend thing. To my knowledge, she that's what that's what she said. Oh, but... I didn't actually mention about it, and probably she just tell you about the National Advocacy Conference. Yes. I'll be going to both, so I gotta. I'll be. T I'll be going to both. So. You too, and we look forward what? to you joining us. And you can. Yeah. You can also give. Oh, cause that is time around for emerging leaders. We're going to. I'm going. Like, same as usual, we're going to have like a student from Taiwan come here, and we also have like a student who's like Taiwanese and study here too. So mm. you got. You're going to be like a huge inspiration to me. Yeah, I'm going as soon as I get that invite. I'm going. Psst. Yes. Okay. Oh. Let me show, let me send you the Emerging Leaders web page. It'll be easier for you to reference. And probably Janice okay. can help you with the later, uh, later of recommendation too. Sure, because I can't, I can't wait to go. I mean, it's going to be, okay, here we go. Workshop, Emerging Leader Workshop. Let me click on that real quick. Let's see if I uh, turn on website. Yep, click to continue. Uh, let's see. I'm looking right now at it. Here we go. Let's see. It's 2010 Papa. Let's see. Oh, yep. I'm going. <laughs> so fill out registration form. Okay, mm -hmm. by July 10th. Okay, I need to sign. I need to do, do that after our interview. I need to do that. <laughs> Thank you for the support. And we will just ask Janice to help you with the letter of recommendation. We'll just keep pushing her, saying that you got the right up for Naji. Yep. Oh, Corsairs, how you doing? Long time no see. Naji, yeah, long time no see. You doing all right? You? you doing good? I'm doing fine about yourself. <laughs> how is Janice? Janice is fine. You know, I, I talked to her a couple, couple of days ago. We talk, you know, she's so she's very, very busy person, so I know. <laughs> Yeah, so um, we 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 do talk. We always talk about you know what's going on with Taiwan, what's going on about advocacy for Taiwan stuff like that. So she's doing fine though. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, I know that she has been uh communicate in communicate with you regarding right. different things. We will right. plan to come to DC for the September event. I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> I show him the whole calendar. He's like, okay, I'm fully booked. For the entire week. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go. Yeah, I'm going. I'm I'm going to go, go ahead and go. So. 
Got to throw this, got to throw this out and send it, send that to you. So by <laughs> by July tenth. Okay. That's great. So yeah, before because I joined that, Najee and I were actually talking about the reason why we won the second interview because we saw like he was on the news with Ambassador Shao. So yeah, so it would be great if you can like start to brief introduce like your journey with Taiwan. I know you started with like, your pen pal from Kaohsiung, but right. can you like elaborate on that part more and how it connects to you to actually want to like be a strong advocate for Taiwan? Especially okay. from an uh, American perspective. Okay, sure. Um, back in 2010 in uh, September, um, I began college at Wright State University up in Dayton, Ohio. And at that time, Facebook was still a place where college kids go to communicate with people, no matter if it's on, on campus or around the world. So I was in a lot of Facebook groups for Black people and Asian people because when I was younger, I always loved Asian culture. I always loved Japan. Japan was my favorite country growing up when I was a child. Like, because I grew up on anime, I grew up on Japanese food, so, and also PlayStation. So that was, I loved Japanese culture ever since I was younger. So I liked to be around Asian people when I was, when I was young. So um, I was in this group, uh, I think it was like, of like black people, Asian people, of like a group of guy was called officially, but that's what that's what it was called. It was this girl uh, from Gaoshong. Her name was Susie Q, and I remember this. She was a little bit older than me, and she was from Gaoshong. And I don't know. We just started to talk to try to get to know each other, and she was telling me about Taiwan, about what the Chinese do to Taiwan. And to me, that resonated with me when I was younger. And then I started to research Taiwan on my own. I was like, wait. Taiwan's a country, has its own currency, has its own president, has its own population, and Taiwan's not in the UN. Taiwan doesn't have any different measures with countries around the world. I know why later on that I got older, because that, that I got older, but when I was younger, I said, this is unbelievable to me. How can this country, uh, 23 million people, be excluded from around the world? And you have a uh, China bullying in Taiwan. I was like, oh, this isn't right. So I did my research, and then in October of 2010, I said, okay. Because before that, I thought about, I said, should I, I thought about it. It was never, I never hesitated to become an advocate for Taiwan. I just told myself, okay, let's go, let's go be an advocate for Taiwan. The path that you're going to be on, it's going to be long. It's going to be with a lot of turns and twists, but you will have to, you will learn to be an advocate because this is something that you can talk about. This is something that you can educate people on around you, around like your father, your mother, your friends, your family members, your coworkers. You can tell you about Taiwan as soon as you get the knowledge of Taiwan. So I decided, hey, let's be advocate for Taiwan. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. And it was, it was a slow process too, like. At first, I used to wave the ROC flag, and then when I got the FAPA, I stopped waving it because people, they taught me, hey, this flag oppressed, uh, oppressed my family in Taiwan. Don't wave the flag. So I learned... So I learned that. So it was a small process of, you know, what to read, what 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 to read, you know, what to watch, um, where to get your resources at. All that I had to learn. I didn't learn that the first year I became an advocate, you know. It was slowly a process for me of actually, you know, you know, get researching, getting knowledge. And the first book I ever read was a book by by Lee Dunk Huey called, I think it's called The Elder Statesman. I still have that book downstairs somewhere in my basement. That was the first book I got of Taiwan. Here's the crazy part. I was at my university and there was a used bookstore about 10 minutes away drive, driving. I was in the bookstore. I was looking for books on Taiwan. That's the first book I seen was that. I said, Lee Dung Kuei, who is that guy? Okay, let me, let me research Lee Dung. Let me read Lee Dung Kuei. After that, Lee Dung Kuei is my favorite Taiwanese of our time. I even have his tattoo what? right here. You can't, you can't what? see it. Are you can't really? see it, but you can't see it. But I have oh my quote. gosh, I have, this, I have this quote here, right here. I have this quote. You can't see it to the light. Take a picture. I have this wow. quote right here. Since because Lee Dong Kuei meant a lot to me because he introduced Taiwan to he. You know, he gave he was my I consider him like my teacher of Taiwan because he introduced me to Taiwan after that. So. After that, you know, I've been on this path ever since then, and it's still going strong. Every year I get smarter. Every year I get better. Every year I'm doing more for Papa Taiwan. So it's a long process. I've been doing it for about 12 years now. So I'm real happy that I'm still here. So. And we are glad that you're still here. I didn't know, like, last time you didn't mention about the tattoo of Bali Deng Hui. Yeah, and I have it right here. Yeah, and I gotta say that your knowledge that to differentiate the ROC in Taiwan, it's amazing, I gotta say. Because it's still like something that 
because I just got to America like two years ago, and then I still feel like the gener and my generation that people, my classmate or my friend, they are still trying to grasp the idea of like, okay, what are the differences between the ROC and Taiwan? But you, from your perspective, you tell it differentiate so clearly. Yeah, because I had to learn that. I was like, listen, when you look at Taiwan the first time and you are a foreigner, you, the first thing you see is that flag. Yeah. And you think that the flag is your, they think, oh, it's Taiwan's flag. But come to find out that flag was actually not made in Taiwan, it was made in Nanjing, China, by, by Sun Yat-sen and, and all those other revolutionaries in China back in 1912. That matter of fact, that flag was even proposed to the ROC to at least 1924 after Sun yat -sen died. So it was like, Ta what was Taiwan? Taiwan was part of Japan at the time. That flag doesn't apply to Taiwan. So I didn't know that when I was 19. When I got older, being around Papa, I said, oh, there is a there is a difference here. This flag is not really Taiwan's people. It's like how the American flag is American's flag. All she is not all she's flag. And to this day, I do see a lot of foreigners still wave that flag, but they're not political. They're not in the movement like I am. They don't understand the difference between the ROC. Because if you look at the ROC flag, one thing, it has the K and T. It has the Gourmet Dung logo on it. Why, exactly. would you want to, why would you want to wave that? Knowing the government <laughs> did what they did to Chinese people, they did two two a they they did, <laughs> a lot, did a lot of they did um white terror they and still today they they with China right now tried to you know suppress Chinese people and have Taiwan be annexed by China so it was like why should you wave that flag you know and I think to me you sh you you know you shouldn't do that especially but people who are not into Taiwan don't know that. That's mm -hmm. why I try to tell people, don't wave it. But people say, well, Najee, well, Najee, a lot of people, times people wave it. So why shouldn't I wave it? That's like, because sometimes people don't, are not political. They don't, they're not really don't care. I care about it because I know Papa, Papa, Papa was made by Peng, I've been reading about Peng Ming Ming lately. I've been reading his book, Taste of Freedom. I'm almost done with that book because I bought it. I bought it after he died because I said, okay, let me read about him. And I read about him. I said, he founded Papa? I said, oh man, I'm in this organization that he made. Oh wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. I like the part of how you connect this to because that I'm um, like it must be heard, it must be I heard the I uh the news that the KMT is actually reopening the like US office here. And then the other day we saw like the picture of my like, office and seeing that. The flicks right over there, just like you got a mixed feeling of that. You feel like, okay, it's a part, it's a political party's office, but why the flicks hanging around here? That's, that's, that's not that does not look right. <laughs> right, it doesn't. And to me, the fact is this, but ROC. The reason why I don't like it is because times people back when World War Two ended, ROC illegally occupied Taiwan. It, it, it was a no, there's no, there was no, you know, okay, Thomas people, what do you want to do? Do you want the ROC or do you want something else? What do you want? It was no choice for that. After Japan left, the Gomadan came, and back then it was a lot of inflation, a lot of corruption. The Ch Times people at the time was like, wait, this is the downgrade. I'm going to give you a sample, okay? At the time, Japan was like a Lexus car. They was reliable. They had um, they built infrastructure in Taiwan. They had like trains, hygiene, um, name it. Japan did it. And when the Gomadan came, it was like a used Chrysler 300 that was used with an old engine. That's how I like to I like to c compare that because you had a Lexus and then you then you then the Gomadan came and you have a Chrysler now. That's a big that's a big 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 difference on how. Japanese times people were treated, even though Chinese people were discriminated in during, during the Japanese period. But at the same time, though, it was like it was like Chinese people weren't like they, Japanese people were not kill well killing Chinese people like like the Gomer Dunk did. So that's what I want to RLC. But you're right about that. When the KMT opened their office, I just laughed at it because it's like you're not you're not really pro American. History would tell you they're not pro American. Look. <laughs> Look how the government down treated the Americans, even when they had diplomatic relationship. Just, just look at it. They didn't like America at all. They just love, they love American money. They love that, but they didn't love the America like the vice of democracy or freedom at all. So. Yeah. Yeah, you understand this part more than uh, many Taiwanese. <laughs> it's, it's just, I like to read, so. <laughs> so. Are you 
it's a good one because you know ironically because I wa I went to the the camp chairman Eric Chu's like his speech at Brookings, and he's been telling about how much like the history between the KNT and the the U.S. government and how were they, like they used to be the strong ally, but like you say, it's just like okay ironically it does not seem right nowadays. <laughs> Right. I was so mad he met Shabbat. He's my congressman. I'm in District oh, yeah. District 1. But I understand Shabbat. Shabbat, he, you know, he's pro-Taiwan. He's been that way since he got to Congress. I understand he wanted to meet anybody. But if I was his his um, his um advisor, I would say, don't meet with Julie. Don't meet with Julie Lund. He's not, you know, he's going to meet with A, you're going to be dumb. Because if you do, you know, you're going to get the bad pressure that you support his policies. But I understand why he did it. He's a congressman. He doesn't, he's not, even though he proposed a lot of pro-Taiwan bills and love for Taiwan, he doesn't know the political parties that well to say hey we i can't meet with the government dung at all but <laughs> so did you did you inform uh Shabbat about that yeah. and how how was his reactions to that well i didn't talk to him at, at i talked to him yet i've been real busy with a lot of things but this year miss lily wong will help hold another Shabbat um, meet Shabbat meeting because she does it every every year for Sh congressman Shabbat. so when he's there i'll Tell them, hey, don't next time don't stick with the government dumb because you know you're going to people time once going to get the bad impression that you support their policies. I'm gonna let them know that. Let, let them know that because it, it, it probably it's probably gonna be around September or so when he because Lily always hold those events every fall. So I I go to every one of them. So I'll let them know them. I won't forget about that. But yeah, it's great that you mentioned Steve Chappie. So, because I, I got interested in that how you, that like, what are your experience when you're talking to this like, local representative? And as you, as a constituent, how are you approaching it? And then let's talk about Taiwan. So, what you do is that you have to make, when you, when you talk to local, local representative, you gotta make, you gotta make it, you gotta make them care. What I mean by that, you have to emphasize Taiwan, no matter what political side you're on. For example, like if you are going to a, a representative office and you, you deal with, with a Republican, you're going to talk about, you know, Taiwan being against, against communism. Cause when you say that senior war communism, Republicans will latch on to that. They're like, oh, okay, I I get what you're saying. Communism, we we hate communism. You got, and then we talked about Democrat. You got to talk about oh, Taiwan legal, legalized gay marriage. Um, back in 2019, they have they have national health care, and and then you're like, oh, they're like oh, really? Then that's how you get that connection. So it depends on who you're talking to. You got to emphasize those connections to the specific political parties, and then too make it local too. Like think about me, Cincinnati. Cincinnati has a sister relationship with um, New Taipei. Yeah. Um, so I can always emphasize that. Say, hey, did you know? Did you know our district? You know, or in our city, have a sister relationship with New Taipei. Have you been in New Taipei? Have you been in Taiwan before? And that's how you break the ice. So they say, oh, I have, and then you tell them, oh, Taiwan, beautiful country. If you love nature, they have Aliusan. They have Yusan. If you like, you know, shopping, there's Taipei one on one. If you like to go, you know, to like go, you want to go like Vosbro, Taiwan. Like you could go like Nanto. Or you could go to Elon. You could go to Pingdong. You go to all these other places. You know, just emphasize. Got make it, make it. Before you talk about politics, just make it personal. Because if you do that, it's going to break the ice and the people will understand your position a little bit more. That's what I like to do with every person I talk to. Representative, Because me, remember, because me, me and Janice last year, we actually collaborated and we called almost every office in Ohio. All, every yeah. office, me and her. And she got, and she got an award for that. I was proud of her <laughs> for getting that. And and we got, and we did. We, I call it, the, I call it the blitz scheme because... I will I will look up, you know, I will look up all the um all the I'll look up the house directory and I will um you know look up who who's the chief of staff of the office, who's legislative aide. And then after that, I will, you know, contact via email and I'll set up a call time that me and Jens can sit there and talk to him for about 30 minutes or so. And I learned that skill for FAPA. So I learned that for the national I learned that for FAPA, how to, you know, talk, how to talk with these um with these legislative aides. So I thank FAPA for that because I learned that two years ago. So yeah, that was very impressed when I heard Jenny saying that. I was like, wow, wow, <laughs> really? <laughs> it was awesome. I spent a lot of time like going going everywhere. We did. Yeah, we did. We talked. We called a lot of phones. And we got one person to join the Taiwan caucus, which was uh, Congressman Lida. So I was really proud of that because 
you know, like that's one thing I like to emphasize. You're on the Taiwan caucus because it's bipartisan. You support a democratic country. You you support freedom, democracy, um, mar- uh, free, um, free mark, free mark, and all that type of values that we all cherish as Americans to Taiwan. So I'm happy that he joined. My goal this year is to get more people to join the Taiwan caucus because I think that's a little bit easier than passing some bills. Bills, you know, bills are important to pass. But if I could get someone to join the Taiwan caucus after the conversation, then that's a win for um, Taiwan because it's like, hey, at least we have one person that's in the caucus now. Mm. Do you find any challenges while you're talking to them, like um, uh, like talking to the representatives? Do, is there any challenge or what kind of um like in any any um obstacle that you ever experience when you're visiting the Congress or, or on a phone with them? I never got that from my experience, but I'm a little bit different from the reason why, because I, I work I work at a dealership, so I talk every I talk every day. So I'm used to talking to people who are unknown. So I, as soon as I get to talk with you, you know, I, it's all about getting to know the person on the phone. It's hard on the phone because you don't know their personality, you know their demeanor, you know their eyes, you know their hands, or whatever. But on the phone, you can tell by voice, like okay. Is this person the person I'm gonna talk to? Is this person maybe easy to talk to or not easy to talk to? To read the pants, I had as some um A's who you know had one who who you know who was kind of who was tough but he was he was respectful and A's who love to talk about love to talk but it just depends on who you who you get that it depends on on their mood as well but it's never been hard for me because as long as you do your research and you give the A's the material beforehand then it makes it a little bit easier you just tell them, hey we, I gave you the, I gave the bone points I gave you what we what we advocate for a FAPA as soon as they know that, they, they can look, look at the paper. So yeah, Najee, I read HR two three zero dash five five or Sarah Sarah. That way they know, and they would say, okay, you can. At the say, okay, let's emphasize this. Let's give our points without. Let's give our points about why it's important to not only Americans but to Taiwan as well. So it's just it basically about reading the room, reading the phone, and who you're dealing with. But it, but as long as you get through that, then you'll be, you'll be fine. Just remember, break, remember ice break, icebreaker first. And after that, do you talk about your points? Oh, it's a really nice one. It's a really nice technique. And it's actually, it's huge. Like you were saying that you learned from National Democracy Conference about yep. Spiel. And now we're actually learning from you about the icebreakers and then how to read in the room in the phone. Cause that would be a technique now. It's, it's strange that, that are so helpful to us especially when we are doing those congressional meetings. But sometimes the, like the foreign aid might change. So we have, might have a new representative in the house and then we'll be like, okay, then what's the atmosphere right now? How can we approach to them? How can we right. speak their language? Right. That's important because as soon as you figure that out, then that's the hardest part is figuring them out. The easy part is pushing what you want to push for. Because if you're passionate about it and you're doing research, then it's gonna be easy for you. The only thing I do is just say, hey, the only thing you got to do is say, hey, what can I do to make this person, you know, make this person responsive to what I'm advocating for? And that's the most important part. So you you write all about that. So wow. And I noticed that in like in the news, I read the news that you with the ambassador shout. You mentioned that in the future you are actually looking forward to like be the foreign de- uh, delegates for Taiwan. Can you tell us more about what inspired you to be like like you know like the face for Taiwan, and then how would you like to accomplish that? Well, I call myself Taiwan Guoman Wajia Guan. I put it on my Twitter. I say that's, that's what I put myself as yeah. because because in Chinese I don't want to say supporter Taiwan because it's not strong enough and advocate in Chinese is not strong enough so that's why I put Guomin Wai Jia Guan because what I am I've been doing it for about twelve years now I use tattoos I use I used I use writings I used to write I'm gonna start going back to writing because I'm not as busy as I am in the past I do you know I donate to Papa every month um, I do all that the show action when you are a civic diplomat for taiwan you have to use your actions and you have to have knowledge of what you want to talk about because if you don't have those things you can't be a good civic diplomat for taiwan that's just why i use different ways to advocate a lot of people use music they use arts i just like to use like tattoos money and and articles to push my agenda for what i want to do for taiwan and what got me to that point is that Early on when I did advocacy, I wondered, I said, what can I do to raise awareness for Taiwan? Should I stay in the streets and talk about Taiwan to to strangers? Should I should I talk to, sh- what should I do? So what I used to do, I used to 
go on Facebook, write Chinese and English, give articles mm -hmm. about English in Taiwan to all my Facebook friends. I used to talk about Taiwan to my mom and father. I used to talk about Taiwan to my to my friends and my family, even my coworkers. And here's what I did. I had a coworker one time who I used to work with um, at the dealership, and he loved to read. So one day I got him a book by Shelly Rigger called uh, Why Taiwan Matters by Shelly Rigger. I bought him that. I bought him that book for Christmas back in 2018. I said, "Here, I said, you love to read. Read about Taiwan. This is what I'm an advocate for. You know, you like you, your kids mind here. Read it." And he read. It. He said, "Oh, Naja, this time I didn't know Taiwan existed. So I didn't know. So and then." You know, after years of you know talking to people who I know who 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 don't who I know who don't know me, years later have people come to me and say, Najee, China recently, um, you know, China recently, you know, deployed military jets to Taiwan. How's Taiwan? My boss asked me that, and she's not she's not even into Taiwan like I am, but she asked because she sees it on the news. Back when I started in advocacy of Taiwan, Taiwan's even talked about on the news. You can't find it on CNN, Fox, MSNBC, none of that. Nowadays, Taiwan's everywhere. They're on New York Times, Al Jazeera, Reuters, name it. Taiwan is, Taiwan is in the news now. So a lot of people who I talked to said, oh, Niger, that, that Taiwan that was something that you talked about years ago. This is what Taiwan goes through. People now understand because with social media and with new with and with anything else going on Taiwan from the success for COVID for China oppressing Taiwan, stuff like that, et cetera. People now know more about Taiwan than they did back 12 years ago. I started for advocacy for Taiwan. Because back in the day, only news covered Taiwan if Taiwan had like a accident like for example back in Keelong in 2015 uh, 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 a, a, little, a little plane crashed into the middle of middle yeah, of a yeah, road in Keelong yeah. and a lot of people, yeah I remember that like I didn't the every time Tom had a tragedy news reported about it back in the day like CNN reported for for like a minute or so but now you have all these media actually doing segments on Taiwan one Taiwan's being friend by China so it's a different age than what I did when, when I was younger but my, my goal for, my here's my goal for me my goal for me for being an advocate for Taiwan is to keep on raising awareness about Taiwan, let people know who I am. And what, what the ambassador did, she let times people know who I am. So top, now times people who in Taiwan, whoever never met me, they know, oh, he's the, he's a, a Jong, he's the one with the tattoos about Taiwan who's by our sign. And people who force, people who know, who know me on Twitter, know me on IG, they know who I stand about. So my goal for, my goal is for, for me to be a better advocate for Taiwan is to keep doing for FAPA because FAPA is the best vacuum that I could use for advocacy because FAPA, I could push bills, I could keep doing money to FAPA, I can, you know, get more congressmen and women to join Taiwan caucus. So my goal is to have almost, my goal, this is my personal goal, I want every congressman from Ohio to be in Taiwan caucus. That's my goal that I want to do for myself. It's going to be hard, but that's my goal I want. I want every, that way, Taiwan people know, hey, Ohio is by your side. So that's my biggest goal. And my other goal is um, I want the, the I want the tech row name change. That's my biggest thing. I want I want that change. I'm currently about to write an article right now on on you know a why that needs to be done. That's my biggest thing on my mind is having that name change. Because when you hear tech row type of economic culture reps office, it doesn't make sense. Had to represent all of it because they could say, well, you know, we want to provoke China, but what is provoking China? No matter what we do, China will think it's offensive. Why we don't care, we shouldn't care. We're America. We are the strongest country in the world and we defend values. We shouldn't, you know, you know, belittle our ally who, you know, who's a pro-American such as Taiwan. We shouldn't do that to them. Plus, two people say, well, you know, Taiwan doesn't have any diplomatic issue with America. Somaliland doesn't have any diplomatic diplomat relations with um, America, but they had their own representative office because Somalia represented office. Palestine had their own office called Palestinian representative office as well back in the day. So I don't like that excuse. If they if you could do it for Palestine and Somalia, we could do, definitely do it for Taiwan. So that's one of the things I want to push for as well. Well, it's it's an, it's very impressive that you you brought out the Taiwan representative office. Cause me, I remember last year when I was trying to like change my driver's license to the Maryland one, and I was in the local DMV. They told me that they saying that okay, look, you say in your on your passport you say Taiwan, but from the like the certificate that from Techcore it. There's no Taiwan on it. How can I know this certificate is really right. authentic? I'll be like, okay, that's the political pressure that I cannot resolve. But these are actually certified by my embassy. So yeah, this like a back and forth pressure there. It took me almost an hour 
to resolve this. <laughs> and it's until one senior, a senior manager came in saying that, oh, it's okay. Like a few years ago, I cannot deal with the same situation. I can help you with that. Okay, thank you. Good, good, good. Now, I'm sorry that you had to go through that. As a Taiwanese person, you shouldn't have to go through that. And that's what I'm fighting for, too, for Taiwan. Taiwanese people always get belittled. And I don't, and I hate that feeling of times people getting belittled because no matter if it's from China or anybody else, I always hate that feeling in my heart that times people are good people, wonderful people. They get bullied every time by militarily, politically, um, militarily and economically. And to me, that really hurts me. I'll be honest with you. I have, I have anger in my heart every day on how Taiwan is treated in the world. Taiwan is a beautiful nation with 23 million people in it. And the fact that Taiwan can't get into the UN, Taiwan can't get into this. And I know the reason why, of course, I know that, but Taiwan, we sh why, you know, I understand because China's bigger economy, but it doesn't matter. Taiwan, if you have all these small countries that send you one, Taiwan should be in there as well. It should be ignored. Also, I, I like recently there was a story that taught that um Qatar is having their soccer tournament in November and December. I forgot when it was. And at first they put China for Taiwanese people. They put Taiwan and they put Chinese Taipei. And that really made me upset. It's like it's like just keep it Taiwan. I hate Chinese Taipei. I hate that name because the name was by the Gorman Dung back in the eight back in the eighties. Here's the funny. Here's the funny thing. Um, back in the seventies, Taiwan could participate as Taiwan. The name, however, the Gorman Dung said, "Oh, we can't have that. We have to have some type of Chinese in it because we because they Gorman Dung thought back in the 80s that they were still thought they were legitimate government of China, even though they have they been kicked out of China in 1949." And the fact that they had Chinese Taipei as a name, they picked it out. And to this day, that's, that has been a curse on Chinese people. Because no matter if a, if a Taiwanese athlete were to compete in Olympics or any other international sport event, Chinese Taipei is a name. And a lot of people ask me, what is Chinese Taipei? What is that name? I said, it's just a name that uh, um, the uh, old regime to call the KMT put on Chinese people. It's basically a shackle. That time people can't get off their foot. They can't get it off their foot because if they try to, then the Chinese, Chinese athletes can't participate in the Olympics, which is unfair. And that's the reason why I have a lot of hate in my heart as well, because it's like it's unfair. What did times people do to deserve this? They didn't do anything. They're just peace-loving people. They want to live, you know, they want to live in a democ democratic country, they want to make money in Taiwan. They want to be happy. They don't want to be, you know, ran over by foreigners. Because if you look at Taiwanese history from the Dutch to the Japanese, to the Spat, to every to every every foreigner that ever conquered Taiwan since the 1600s, has Thai people never had a say. They never had a say in that. They never had a say of what they want to do. It's always been someone else decided for Taiwan. It's the same right now with the ROC. So. Well, it's impressive. And I, it, I'm impressed by the fact that you know the history of the Chinese Taipei. Because I got the same impression too when I first find out like my my government saying that no, we want Chinese type. I'm like, okay, you gotta be joking me. So the very first time when I learned that history, I'll be like, okay, this is not right. This is not right. We cannot believe up ourselves by doing so. Right. Had a friend who I knew I was who I was uh, twenty years old. She jokingly said, "Okay, this year we Chinese Taipei. Next year we Chinese Gaoshang, Chinese Taijong, Chinese Elon, Chinese Jinmen, Chinese Pingdong, Chinese um um uh, Pangku." She basically was a joke said, "Because here's the reason why: because not every time people person live in Taipei, they yeah. live places in Taiwan as well." Wow. That's really, I like that one. But since you know, because I knew that you want to study in Taipei, study in Taiwan, but do you right. mind telling me about the history, the story that when you were studying in Taiwan? I mean, I was there. I was there for about three months, and I went to I went to Janda for three months because I was still a freshman by the university at Rice State, and I studied about three months in Chinese. That's how I just loved how. I always love Chinese people. Chinese people are wonderful people. Um, they were very nice to me. I I stayed in the dorm. I loved that. Met some good friends in Taiwan, you know, and they were and they were wonderful. And I just had the best experience studying in Taiwan, you know. My plan was to go back to Taiwan and go for my master's degree after I graduated from college back in 2015. However, that you know, with life, life changes. So I was able to do that to go back to Janda and go there for a master's degree. I would have studied, I would study in like Taiwan's diplomacy. That's my. That's what I want to do. It's study Taiwan's diplomacy because I because you know because I'm interested in Taiwan's diplomacy. I'm interested in what 
because Taiwanese, Taiwanese diplomats are the best people in the world. They have the hardest job in the world. And I've seen that lot. I've seen that in person while I was in Columbus for a select Ohio, select, select Taiwan. I seen that person how they, what they were running around, make sure everything was right. I seen that person. I said, "Wow, be talented, different man. You really, really, really have to have the endurance and and the heart to do that job because it's difficult because you're not recognized as a country, which is unfair. And two, you have to do, you have to go above and beyond on you know on your being a diplomat for a country. That is that's why my time is diplomats for it. That's why I wanted to study that when I was younger because I wanted to understand you know the process of Chinese diplomacy, and how that's conducted." <laughs> And of course, it's actually graduate from Zhenda. <laughs> yeah, I was I was wondering which year was well, were you in when you were studying in Zhenda? It was 2010, at, in November, because it was. Yeah, I I was in Zhenda since 2007 to 2011, so probably were we met somewhere on campus. <laughs> we, we probably did. I want to go back there too. I, that's still my goal. Like I said, Narco, I want to I want to go back there one day. But due to my job, I probably can't go back there <laughs> to study. But hope that that's one of my goal one day. I want to go back there and do my master's there. That's still my goal because I read. That's what I want to do. But I don't know how I'm gonna do it. But it will happen one day, hopefully. And yeah, I I used to I used to work as a volunteer of CIEE in Zhengda. I don't know if oh, really? you joined that program. Yeah, it's uh, also a uh, like a student ambassador that helping people uh, from overseas to learn Chinese. That is oh, one of the programs. Oh, you were in that? I didn't know that. Probably probably, probably, probably met there. Yeah, I, <laughs> probably met. Yeah, no. yeah. yeah, I was with Chris, Christy. I don't know if you know Christy. She's on uh, the the boss of CIEE in Zhengda. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, so so I know her, and she wrote me the recommendation when I was applying to the master in AU. So <laughs> yeah, it's just nice. So the reason yeah. why I picked Zhengda is because my major was political science. I love politics, so that's why I picked Zhengda. I like the name. I said, oh, but <laughs> come to <laughs> find out, <laughs> come to find out that school had a big. Chiang Kai, I seen it. The Jung, big Chiang Kai. I said, "Oh, yes. I was like, oh, that's not good. Get remove, yeah. remove that." Yeah, you know, there's a pretty funny ghost story saying that when Chiang Kai, uh, the statue of Chiang Kai Shek in Zhengda, actually the horse will shift the leg at night. <laughs> so people, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that's true. I, I heard that. Know. Oh, you heard that too. I heard that. <laughs> Oh, you heard it? Oh, Liz tells that you two once studied in the same school. <laughs> Can you share oh, that with me? <laughs> That's really funny. Yeah, sorry to cut you again. <laughs> Jenny, I can carry on with your questions. Yeah, because I just want to say that, I mean, you want to study like the diplomacy for Taiwan to finish your master. And I'm pretty sure your experience that you have with FAPA or with what you are doing right now can be pretty impressive. So I think my question would be more like, have you ever, like, like would you say that the starting of your journey with Taiwan, have you ever thought about that like, one day you'll be able to meet a person like Steve Shevick, the person like Ambassador Shao? Like, have you ever dreamed of the moment like this? No, I'll be honest with you. When I, when, I be, when I began the process back in 2010 for myself, I didn't expect that I was going to be Shabbat, Bastard Shao, or Fop. I didn't expect that when, when I was when I was a 19 year old. I thought, okay, we go read, read, read books about Taiwan, we'll learn about Taiwan, we'll, we'll sign petitions for Taiwan, anything else. But it was meant for me to be an advocate for Taiwan because I'm from Cincinnati. Cincinnati and Ty New Taipei have a sister relationship. Shabbat is also a congressman from there. He's been pro Taiwan, as you know, for about the past twenty over twenty something twenty something years. So it's meant for me to be an advocate for Taiwan because anything aligned for me to be one. I didn't expect, I expect me to you know to meet to to be in Fapa either. I expect that either. It just that's how life is like that. You don't you don't know you never know what you're gonna be as. Only thing you have to do is just keep on being keep on holding your values keep on going because you never know what's going to happen to you and i'm happy i kept that kept going on that path you know i knew in the beginning that's going to be hard i knew it was going to be easy but i love the challenge i said okay let's do something different because here's the thing you are not taiwanese you're black so we, when you talk about taiwan people's going to be curious like like wait because people told me this, people told me this a long time ago. They said, Najee, if you were Taiwanese, people probably would not listen 
if you're a white, they, if you're a white, people will think that your wife is Taiwanese, so you're an advocate for Taiwan. But since you're black, people think that hey, what are you talking about? What's Taiwan? What is it? Let me know about Taiwan. And I, I thought that was a little bit offensive because I was like, wait, that's not true, you know. But then I realized I said, like, oh, you're probably right because not not you, not to be people are like me. Who has all these tattoos? Who's like me? No one like me. I mean, if you, I mean, there's probably people of my color who love Taiwan, but I don't, you're probably not as expressive as I am with Taiwan. So, but just anything is meant to be, you know, Papa doesn't care about color. That's not, it's not the thing here. The point is that by me being who I am, it allowed me to open up a lot of doors that I never would imagine would have opened up back when I was a 19 year old. Now I'm 31. So, and, I, and I'm still young too. So the doors are still going to be open for me. Cause I'm still young and if Papa, so <laughs> but I gotta say your journey that you say how Papa inspired you, how Pomo me inspired you, but I gotta say yes. that your story inspired us too. Because like throughout the 12 years of your advocation, you advocate uh, advocating for Taiwan, you show us what little changes is changes that you truly show us the fact that how we have to uh, be perseverant for the thing that we are doing because we believe it we believe the fact that need change can be changed too and then the accumulation can be huge yes um i told myself when i started this journey i said hey i'm not taiwanese i don't have anybody that went through 22a or white terror or any tragedy that Taiwanese people experience so have to go 110 percent on what i'm gonna do because i'm I'm from the outside. I'm, I'm, I'm an outsider because I don't have that connection like how you two have them. So I have to go above and beyond to show times people, hey, I am worthy of being part of your community. This I am this. I'm using my actions to prove to you that, hey, I really do love your country. I'm gonna do everything I can for Taiwan. And I mean, it's rewarded me. And I'm and you know, and like I said, I'm still young, so it's still it's gonna keep on going. It's going. It's not. It's going to keep on going to the top. Going to the top because of who I am and what I represent for Taiwan. So, I think Fapa. I you know in the beginning, um, I I thought Fapa only existed you know in big cities like San Francisco, New York, Texas, all they know. So here's what happened. One day, um, I told you a story, the first interview um, about how I got to Fapa. So I'm not going to go with that because you already know the story already because that's, that's already in the book already. But um, being in Fapa is the best decision I've made in my life because it allowed me to get to know other people who are also like-minded people like me, who, you know, who loves Taiwan, who, you know, wants to do anything they can for Taiwan. And I was so happy to be able to go to those meetings with Lily Wong, to be able to, you know, um, to do it, to, to begin the, the FAPA 100. I've been doing it for, I've been, FAPA 100, I love that I did it too, because I always told myself, how can I support FAPA instead of doing it worse? How about I use other actions as well? So I said, by me giving 100 every month, it allows them to have their operation, the Congress run smoothly. Even though my 100, my FAPA 100 is going to end in October, October and in August of this year, I'm still gonna keep give a hundred to FAPA every month because I want to keep it going. I want to make sure that um FAPA continues to operate the way it is because FAPA is such a wonderful organization that you know, despite what I look like, depending on where I come from, FAPA said to me like like I'm a family member. And to me, that means a lot to me more than anything. I met people like you two, I met Janice, I met people like Lily Wong, I met people like Christopher Lin, I met people like Minza, all the people who are wonderful leaders in FAPA, I um I met them. And my goal is one day is to be part of the leadership as well. That's my goal. Um, my goal, I want to be, at, I wanna be at, at large representative. I want to be that for FAPA. That's my goal. It's, I, it's hard because people got to vote for you, but I want to do that one day. I want to be at large. At large, I want to do something for leadership for FAPA. I want to do something because I say, hey, I, I have a lot of ideas I want to do. I have a lot of things I want to do for FAPA because I know I give money, but I'm also being part of the means as well. So, hey, how can we do, what can we do to to make people more Americans know about Taiwan? How, what can we do to make our, our agenda go further than the way it is right now? Yeah, and then it would be great because I gotta say it would be it would be tr uh, tremendously helpful to have you to be in those positions because your is your story is not just not just inspiration inspiration and also like you show us that the way to create that to advocate for Taiwan as a mm -hmm. as an organization like FAPA because 
we are also like as the organization in Papa, we are also like how to like thinking about how to like transition to the next phase. How we can do like the be the Papa 2.0. And yes. then to bring in more younger generation and then to That's why I advocate. That's what I want. That's what I want. Um, sorry to interrupt you. That's what my points would be. If I were got to be a leadership in FAPA, what I would advocate more is younger people, because younger people are the it's 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 the blood of the organization because people like Peng Ming Ming and our generation, they set the foundation. The only thing we gotta do is keep it up. So we need more young people like our, us free, Janice, our people who are younger that can because we, we're next. When they when old people re retire, it's our shoulders to make sure FAPA keeps going strong. That's why we need more younger people in FAPA. Um, second thing I would change for FAPA too is that you you uh, we need our social media needs to be better too. Like uh, we you know like I understand one person does it. We need more people to do to be. We need like a committee of free people to be to be you know a FAPA me social media social media organization. Like free people. You need like free people that you know you could trust that can help you get more people to understand Taiwan. Facebook is fine. I Facebook is good, but you need to go on Twitter more, which you do have that. You need to go on IG more and get those free things. You need to use those free instruments because if you use those free, you will do better. And you need to have a younger person run those accounts that way. Because younger people, we know what to do. We know, okay, this is what we have to push for. So you need a, a committee. You have a finance committee. You need also a social media committee of these free people that you can trust with that. That way, those free people can talk every day. It's okay. What can we What can we post? What can we talk about? Let's this fake news about Taiwan. Let's this this dispel that. And back in the day, Fapa used to have like a truth teller thing. They used to put used to put posts in those little four month uh four month booklets that we used to get back in the day about you know um so so fake news about Taiwan. That needs to happen again, but only Twitter and IG. That way, people who use it, not Facebook but those platforms can understand too. Okay, this thing is about this educate more people about Taiwan. So you need a committee for that for these three people. That's what I recommend that you do. Along with younger people. I think that and we would definitely like tell our like tell me that tell me this idea because that's also one aspect that we are thinking about like how to expand to how to expand our social media promotion not just promotion but also like you said to educate to use them as a platform to educate younger generation and then to get close to the younger generation and to let them know about Taiwan. Right. And I have 16,000 followers on Twitter. So I know, I know how to, you know, I know how to, you know, um, push, educate people about Taiwan. So, but like I said, if you did it, if you were to did a community like that in the future, like have two more, like I could be a part of it. You get two more other social media people as well. That way we all freaking sit down and say, okay, what can we as a team, what can we do to make our clip matches clear? So, but yeah, so by you doing, by you thinking about that, you understand the game or how it is because social media is the game that, that you have to play it's not old school where you can just type a big paragraph about what you do it has to be short and to the point about taiwan you have to you have to fight back against fake news you have to defend taiwan on those social media platforms that way they know okay papa is in the 21st century because as i re i respect whoever's behind those i respect whoever's behind the twitter i respect those but I just feel to me you need some way you need some more people who are more me savvy to you know help get more young people to join FAPA and get more people to understand this is our position. We're not going to back down from our positions in a respectful way, of course. Yes, that's never good. And uh, I got to say that you know, this time around, you come here to DC and then to join the Emerging Leaders Workshop. No, but I mean, this time around, we're going to need your help <laughs> to help us like, to attract more younger generation here because like me studying in DC over the past two years, I do see an increase for Taiwanese Good. people to come to the United States and then to actually study about particle science. And then some mm -hmm. of them, their focus might be around the like, cost issue or like right. how to defend Taiwan, Taiwan. And right. you also see like the thing like the GTI or like Project 2049. They are actually right. talking about Taiwan. So this time right. around with that, we definitely need your help and then to uh, tell us to attract those people to know about Taiwan. I'd be more than happy to do that. I'd be more than happy to sit down with them and everybody talk about what can we do for Taiwan because we need to, as young leaders, we need to, you know, yeah, they have, we, so far we haven't put our roots in the ground yet. It has a, we haven't grown to a tree yet. It's gonna take a while for our results to grow to a tree. We are just we just we have to plant seeds. 
if we're doing that now, we got to keep on planting seeds. And then one day, hopefully, those seeds will be to, to big trees that will last for generations and generations. So it starts young because as a young person, you going to you will think about stuff. If you're older, you're not going to um, accept some things because you're old. You think you know you think you waste the waste the highway. But if younger people, you can sit down and talk to us, hey, this is what this is what's gonna happen. This is what we advocate for. And they will understand, okay. And then young person will say, Okay, I'll do it. Cause and then you get in, that's how you get that's how you get them in. You got basically bring you got to bring them in in a gentle but fun way. You know what I'm saying? You can't be about, you know, like cause because I'm different, you know. I read like I said, I'm different a lot of people. I read about 20 Taiwanese news a day, 20 English and Chinese every day. I read. I read like I read John Yasa, I read Zio Shiba, I read Stanley, I read Minsher. You know, I read a lot every single day. I read English, I read Focus Taiwan, English, I read um Taipei Times, I read Taiwanese. I read every day. That way I know what's going on in Taiwan. I read, I, I'll be honest with you, I know about what's going on in Taiwan than I know about what's going on in America. Even though I live here, I know more about what's going on. I know I could tell you what happened yesterday. I could tell you, you know, anything that's going on right now in Taiwan. But remember, I can't tell you that because I'm not, I'm not focused on American politics like I am. I'm focused on more top Taiwan. That's just why I read about 20 articles a day. That mm. way, that She's way, so my TV channel. <laughs> silently. Oh my god, you gotta be, you gotta be a good friend with my dad. <laughs> he, he reads to your spot every day and watch Sunday every single day, <laughs> and you just keep yeah, he, watching all the like political shows. Yep, he he, he watches Shin, he watched Shin Tao and Jayo, he watched all, he watched all those shows right yeah, there. Yeah, and I just just all that, and like, oh, yeah, I, I know who that is. Yep, I used to, when I was um, working from home, I used to watch him every day while I was working from home, so I used to watch him <laughs> every day. So, speaking of Sonley, <laughs> speaking of Sonley, you know, they interviewed me, um, Sonley interviewed me, um, when I met the ambassador. So I, I shout out to them. Yeah, I read I read the art I read the news that I read was like the digital one. But I didn't but I don't know if they have a clip still. So here's what happened with the whole bastard, because you didn't ask me that question. So after Ohio and Ta and Taiwan established a Ta uh, Ohio Taiwan friendly caucus, I told Janice said Janice, by the end of the day, I'm going to get a picture with the ambassador. Cause she's my favorite people. I love, I love, I love her. I love Lee Dunk Wei. I love Chai Wen. I love Wu Jiao Shi. I, you know, I like, I, I, I like, um, I like Lai Ping Yu. I like Jimbo Wei. I like Freddie Lim. I, I love all those. You know, I, I say I love all those. So for me to be meet the ambassador would be the greatest thing in my life. So I told you, I said by the end of the day, I'm gonna get, hope I get a picture of her. That's my, that's my goal. After she was done announcing, after the press conference was done about the uh, about the Ohio Taiwan Friendly friend, Friendship Caucus, it was a big line because a lot of times people want to take pictures with her. So I stood in line with Janice. So I went to her. I said, Miss Ambassador, I like to I like to take a picture. She said, she's like, oh sure, that's fine. And I don't know what happened. I said, Ambassador, I've been an advocate for Taiwan since I was 19. Here's my tattoos to show it. I showed her. I don't know what I don't know why it happened. I wasn't planning to do that. It was just out of nowhere. I was like, let me this is my tattoos. And she was like, she was shocked. She's like, she said, Oh, she said, How long have you been an advocate for since I said since I was 19? She said, You still look 19 years old. So she, That's and, and I took a picture with my tattoos out like that. And here's what happened. Seven times people had their phones out, taking pictures of me with my arm out with the ambassador, like like this position, like 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 this, have it right here, like this, for like about like for like about two minutes. And what happened after that? Um, I was driving back, and Tony's person that I know texted me. He said, "Have you looked on Twitter?" I said, "What happened on Twitter? What happened?" He said, "You on Twitter? The ambassador put your picture up with with you on Twitter. Look at it." I looked on there. It was right there. And I remember she said that I think I met Taiwan's best friend in Ohio. His arm said, defend Taiwan and self-determination for the Taiwanese people. And I was like, I didn't know she was going to do that. I did not know that. I didn't know she was going to do that. I did not know at all. I didn't. She didn't tell me she was going to do it. I didn't know that's going to happen. And then later, I found out from another person. friends. He said, did you look on Facebook? I said, what's on Facebook? The bastard with your picture up on Facebook as well with her. I checked there. 
uh, the first hour, it was about over 5,000 people liked it. And then after the next couple of days, over 30,000 people liked it. Over 500 people shared it on Facebook and on, on Twitter. Over 5,000 people liked it. And over about 1,000 people sh uh, sh shared it on Twitter. And I didn't know she's going to do that. Here's what probably happened. This is my guess. I didn't know this is going to, I, this is what I, I, I talked to her about. This. this is what happened. Perhaps what happened probably was that after she took the picture with me, probably the master probably t asked people in Chicago because remember, 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 the office in Chicago, they know me. They sent me stuff before. They talked to me before on Twitter. They know who I am. They know who I am in Chicago. So, so what happened was she probably asked them, who is that guy with the tattoos? Oh, that's a John. He's on Twitter. Here he is. That's when, you know, she put, that's why she put the pictures up on Twitter. She followed me too. She followed me on her too. So I was like, yes. <laughs> so. Oh, so I didn't know that. That's one of the biggest surprises I got in my life. Like, oh, I didn't know she's gonna put it. On. If if I see if I see her this year again, I'll say I'm gonna thank her for that because I know I didn't know she's gonna do that. So, did I'll you thank her for that. were you attacked by any like pro China people uh, because of the, of the post? Is there I something was, like that? I was, if I could say 98%, I got love from Taiwanese people. People will say, oh, thank you, Ajong, for love in Taiwan. Um, thank you very much for doing what you do for Taiwan. You know, you are Taiwan's brother, stuff like that. I mean, pro Chai people didn't say much, but I did get one blowback by someone who was in the Black Lives Matter movement who lived in Taiwan. He was, he's a pro-black person. Pro -black, he's really pro-black. He hates that. He believes that black people shouldn't advocate for, shouldn't be advocate for, you know, anything else besides black people issues, which I don't agree with. That's my personal opinion on that. I don't agree with that. I think that no matter what race you are, you should be advocate for everyone. We believe it. I don't know if it's Taiwan, abortion, whatever, you should be advocate for whatever you love and passionate about, not just because of your race. So the guy, this is how I found out. One follower on Twitter told me, he said, hey, this guy on Twitter, this guy on, on YouTube is, you know, slander you. Here's what he said right here. He showed me the the, the clip, whatever. And the guy told me, the guy called me a sellout. He said that, um, he told, he said to all the black men who go to Taiwan, times people will expect you to be just like this, expect to be like a junk. You know, this is embarrassing to our race. Stuff like stuff, just stuff, just really, just a lot of um nonsense that he said. And the guy lived in Taiwan for three years, but the guy wasn't loved like how I was well, how I was loved by the Chinese people. So I laughed at it. I wasn't mad about it because all my life I've been attacked by Guomindang people, people who are pro-China, people who are Black Lives Matter. I've been attacked by everybody, but it did not stop me from loving Taiwan at all. I just you know I, I got more love than hate. People every day thank me for love of Taiwan, but I'm always confused about why you thanking me. I should be thanking you for giving me the destiny of being an advocate for Taiwan, for, for introducing Taiwan to me. Because if I Taiwanese people, I wouldn't know about Taiwan. I wouldn't know about advocacy. I wouldn't know about having a mission in my life. So I thank Taiwanese people every day, every day. So I just think every time someone thanks me for who Taiwanese, I just think like, don't thank me. I, be, I should be thanking you. So I got more love than hate. I got 99% love, 1% hate. And so people who hate me, I don't care because I'm, 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 I'm going to be me regardless. I'm going to love Taiwan no matter what. I got 28 tattoos to prove that I love Taiwan. So I was like, hey, you can't please everybody in life. So I'm not going to please anybody who doesn't like what I'm going to do. I'm going to always be me. Well, that's, that's I kind of say that's a good mentality that you have because I understand you nowadays that you say that everybody, basically everybody's on social media. And right. when you are being a strong advocate for something that you believe, you have to. It's like you have no choice but to like face all the hostility right. from people on the other side of the spectrum. So right. yeah, that's just like that leads to like that just follow by what can say ask. But over the past twelve years that have we ever like faced a severe challenge like this just that when people just like keep like going like umau and they just go, keep on going to you and then just like to talk to you like no you shouldn't be believe what you believe that this is that type like basically they would say that okay Taiwan's part of China and this is why it is like, have right. you ever and how have you ever faced any hostility like this and how you, you address that well, I've been real lucky in my life not to listen to people what they have to say because my mother, she's really, my mom has strong beliefs in what she believes in a lot of things and she taught me that you cannot 
please everybody in line if you got you got to keep on going what you want to do cuz some people going to love you people going to hate you regardless of what you say or what you do and i've been called the n word by chinese people i've been called a dog i've been called everything negative about i've been people say your mother i had sex with your mother your dad is dead i pissed on your mom's grave stuff stuff that's disrespectful that you never say in person but you say it to an online person i just never I used to fight them back. I used to, you know, talk to them Chinese. I just say, I used to fight them back in Chinese, but now I got older. I said, I just ignore them. I said, hey, because you want to raise, you want a outrage out of me. You want me to be upset, but I'm not mad. You can call me anything you want to call me. I mean, I don't care. I mean, I mean, if I care about what someone that doesn't know me say about me, why should I care? I get, like, people who know me, they tell me, hey, Najee, you're doing a good thing for Taiwan. Keep it up, man. You make, you doing change. My mom and dad support me. My friends support me. A lot of people who know me, they support what I do. I get that love. From, and all times, people who know me, they love, they they respect what I do. And Fapa knows as well. So I, it never, I never, people that say anything bad about me never been severe. It's just been petty. It's been small. I, I think about for like about a minute now, forget about it. I say, you know what? You just, you just, I say, you, you're in my way. I got to keep up going this path. So on the members of my women keep on running. I'm not going to stop because of one person. Well, time was trying to just stop. I know the truth. I read a lot. If if I didn't, if, it took me a while to understand that. I read a lot. I study a lot. I do a lot, and that's the reason why I could tell people, "Hey, your 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 views are wrong about Taiwan," and I'm right because this I got facts on my side. You got fake news from Xinhua. I got I got real information. So it's like you can't tell me what I don't know about Taiwan. You know what I'm saying? You were raised in China to believe in one party. I was born in a free country called America that taught me to free think and research what you want to research about being about, about being restricted by the government. So I know more than you about Taiwan. So you can't tell me what I don't know. So that's all I like to tell them. But with people who are ignorant like that, you have to ignore them because you got to be the better person because that now that I got bigger, people like Ambassador Shao, like Ping Yu, all the people, all the all the MC offices in America, they all follow me now. So I cannot respond or say anything bad because I don't want to look bad. I don't want to. I don't want them to drag me down. I want people to say. I want people to respect me and to you know respect what I'm doing. I don't want to be you know in a negative person who goes back and forth with somebody who doesn't even know me online. Mm. So. Wow, that's. And that's really impressive, I gotta say. And in as a matter of fact, it actually remind me of someone from Taiwan. Just give me one sec. I'm gonna grab his book because I believe you're going to love his book. Just okay. Give me one second. Yeah, I, I think we definitely need to learn um from you for from your attitude because people sometimes scared of being the, the opinion of, of others and they dare not speak out for Taiwan. So sometimes they People at work, is, their colleagues are Chinese. They say, "Oh, we are Chinese people, just like that." They yep. just dare not speak out. Right. Yeah. So we all have to learn from you, for from your attitude and your the the way you think towards those hostile opinions. Yeah. Because here's the thing with them, okay? People who are Chinese. They don't. People who are Chinese, they don't have their own. They have their own mentality. They learn. They learn from the government what to say, what to think. So. You already lost. They're, they're lost right there with me. Your opinions are from the CCP. They're not your own opinions. They're from a government who've been brainwashed since you were a child. While me, I've been learning Taiwan for about twelve years now. I can, I read a lot. I know more than you. Like I said before, it's like I said before to you. So, what can you tell me that you believe in? You just regurgitating what someone else told you. You didn't research yourself about what that you believe this this fake belief about Taiwan. But a lot of people, the reason why times people are probably not as vocal is because they grew up in a household that that didn't don't that that discourage politics. So I know a lot of times people who grew up in that environment where the parents have said politics is dirty, don't get into that, don't talk about politics. But that's changing with the South Carolina movement. A lot of people who are South Carolina, it's, like, it's only changing. A lot of young people are starting to be more active in politics in Taiwan. So that's that trend is slowly going down but in the past it was like that like because they grew up in because remember the parents grew up in 22a and they also grew up in the white terror so back in the day talking about politics was basically taboo so they put they put it on their on their children say hey don't talk this taboo don't talk about politics you're going to uh, get yourself in trouble but with politics it's about believing what you believe no matter what position you believe in, you have to believe it yourself because if you don't believe it, you can't speak it, you know, because how can you speak about something if you don't believe it yourself? If you believe that Taiwan should be defended, 
how about you believe it with all your heart and back it up with details of why you think so? Because if you don't believe it, then don't talk about it. Because if you don't, if you don't believe something, people, because remember, you are ambassador to Taiwan. You are ambassador yourself. So what you talk about reflects on Taiwan. So you cannot say anything that's false about Taiwan. Because if you do, people is going to say, well, this guy says about this, about say this. So this is what we think about Taiwan. So we there's no trial for error. You have to make sure that you, you cross your eyes and you cross your t's and dot your eyes because if you don't do that then you're gonna you're gonna um potentially make things not good for taiwan so you have to make sure you gotta make sure that you your a game is up wow and it's it's interesting that you mentioned some florida because kose i remember the first time kose and i met we actually talked about some how some flower inspire us and then to like to join the movement and then to advocate for Taiwan because it's a good experience for us to like, especially for me to like to figure out, okay, what things that I stand and how to like you say to do the research, to read by yourself and mm -hmm. not to be like biased by all the like, mainstream media. Right, right. The Sunflower Movement saved Taiwan because without the Sunflower Movement, Taiwan would have been part of China right now because Mind Joe was really pushing that that trade pact with China, he was basically saying, okay, just pass it. Don't review it. Don't look at it all. Don't do none of that. Just, just pass it. But if you look at the details of the, of that, of that, of, of that, it had about giving control, have the Chinese people, Chinese investors come and invest in, in infrastructure. That's dangerous for national security reasons. Those have, they have also have information such as like, um, have a Chinese um like investments in infrastructure also in like in like businesses stuff that can negatively affect Taiwan and to have give, give Chinese access to like farming and to technology and semiconductors which is dangerous for Taiwan so without the students Taiwan would have been Hong Kong right now because as soon as you get too reliant on China then you're done right now Taiwan's export to China is forty percent forty percent which is a big number. Oh, so because if you look what happened with the uh with with the groupers, the fish that that they, they banned in Ping Dong recently, and now that the now that the uh, fisherman Ping Dong is lost the Chinese market, they go into Japan now because it lost the Chinese market, because ninety percent of the grouper fish went to China, which is bad because you rely on one market for everything. That's not how you should do it. You should venture out to Japan, South Korea, Australia, um, Indonesia, America, whatever whatever it is. You know, so right now, my hope is how one day lessening, lessening its, its reliance on the Chinese economy, because the less, the more, the less that you let, let the, um, the, um, the more that you um, get rid of the reliance on China, the more Taiwan will be better, because I always say this, economic uh, freedom is also political freedom. So mm -hmm. if you don't, if you don't have that, then you're done. That's a good one. That's a really good one. Because this is a book, and it's going to be the gift that we give to you when you come to I'll read it. on September. You read it already? Yeah. No, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it. I need yeah, a new it's book. Good. And then I promise it's going to be your gift when you come to BC. I put a link here so like you can have a review to see that what's a book. But it's basically just like you, you just like your story, like made me resonate with him a lot. Because he's not, he's just like the thing, all the thing that he does just out of his pure love for Taiwan. And interestingly, your story reminds me of him. Now, I, I'm honored to feel that way because sometimes people, you know, like people like Peng Ming Ming and uh, Su Bing and people like uh, Li Dong Hui and people like um, people who, people who, uh, people like Jun Nai Rong, they die for Taiwan, for Taiwan to be what it is today. They they have a, they basically set the foundation that I'm on right now. I'm not a hero like the, how they are. They already, they, people who was in, who was in White Terror, they were banned from coming to back to Taiwan. They were murdered. They were tortured. And all all other imaginable things after the time is people who fought for Taiwan's freedom. Taiwan's freedom was based on the blood, the, the time, and the sacrifice for Taiwan to be what it is today. It wasn't Jun Jin Guo. Jun Jin Guo did not give Taiwan democracy. Taiwan people fought for that democracy. So I'm I'm not any of those people that I mentioned before. See, I'm just a person who's walking a path right now that, that they laid out. My my goal is just to walk on the path and make sure the path keeps on going. Oh, I love this. I love I love the way how you like incorporate this and into your path. Have you ever watched the TV series The National Island? 
I haven't seen that one. Is it what's it about? I haven't I seen Island it's Nation. About, it's about like how he got like after Zhang Jingguo passed away, how he transitioned to be like to be from the vice president to be the president and then to be the chairman of KMT. And then you see that how he made this. And also you see that how he abolished the martial law. And yes. then to implement the full election. So you gotta you gotta watch that one. I'm pretty sure you're gonna love it. Yes, I read about free books on Lee Dung Kuei. He's one of my favorite politicians of, of ever. I have, like I said, I have him on my, on my body, his quotes that he said about, you know, I have, have both his quotes on my body. So what about what about well about what Lee Dung Kuei did was that it was a slow process. He knew he couldn't, he had to go in the system and do it. Cause you have people like Song Mei Ling and all the people, and people, people like Hao Chun that's trying to sabotage Lee Dun Kuei. But he kept on going. Like for example, when the white, when the white, when, when the white lily, when the white lily um, movement happened in the 90, in the 90s happened, Lee Dun, what happened? Lee Dun Kuei was looking at, let's look at Beijing and say, okay, Tiananmen Massacre happened happened a year a, a, a year before. Let me talk to these students in that way and see what the demands were. Demands were like get rid get rid of the thousand thousand year old uh, Congress, uh, do 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 direct elections, and also repeal criminal code criminal code one hundred. Criminal code one hundred basically was sedition. That's how Jun Na Rong. That's how he died because because back because back, cause back in the day. Uh, even though after John Jing Gul, you know, got rid of Mar got rid of martial law, it was still criminal code 100 that you still could get arrested for. You couldn't write a Taiwanese constitution. You couldn't do couldn't do that back after at, after he died. So Lee Dong Wei had to repeal it. That way, now the criminal cri criminal code only be for like offenses, like if if, 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 if you rob somebody or if you you know do something really really terrible, not for political faults. So Lee Dong Wei got Lee Dong Wei successfully implement those free policies and then what about him is that after 2000 he could have stayed in office but he said you know what i'm gonna give it to someone else let me just let's do let's do let me do two terms and i'm out like how george washington was for america for saying two terms and um and in america he done what they did for taiwan because he could have stayed on for a while but he didn't do it because he understands that for taiwan to be a good democracy you have to do transition of power so yeah. but yeah that's good <laughs> We all love Lee Dunghui. <laughs> yeah, we all love. Him. Yeah, I do. He's my one of my favorite people of all time. And here's the thing about my, my tattoo: he died on um he died um July thirty first of twenty twenty. When I found out that he died, um, I talked to my tattoo artist named Chris, and I told Chris, "Hey, I need I need to get a tattoo of this time's president who died not that long ago. What can we get in?" He said, "Okay, my book is my, I'm booked out August. How about you come in? Um, how about you come in?" on September 20th. September 20th was when Lee Dong Hui's funeral was. And that's before we knew the funeral was what was even there. Really? I didn't, wow. yeah, yeah, it was meant to be. I was like, because that funeral, I didn't know. Because remember, at the first, first, we didn't know. They were still, you know, figure out, okay, what day are we going to have this the state funeral on? It was also on September 20th. So I, and I'm like, wow, that was really meant to be. Because we, we just picked a random date on a Saturday. I didn't, we didn't know that it was going to be his actual funeral on that day. Because this is back in end of July that we, Hand appointment for me, to, for me to do that tattoo anyway. So I was like, oh, it was meant to be. It was just meant to be to get that done. Wow. I, I, I gotta say, I love this connection and this coincidence too. It is. It is for me. Taiwan, you know, no matter, I don't question it. If it, hap if it happens for Taiwan, it happens. It was meant for, it was meant, it was meant to be for a lot of things for Taiwan. So, so I'm happy I'm still here. Mm. And I gotta say, I was surprised by you that you brought up the white lady movement because I remember that I, when I was watching Fan Yun's interview, that she was mm -hmm. like the student leader back in the white uh, lady movement. She mentioned mm -hmm. that because that just like a few days ago, it was like the Tian I'm a square thing, and then she's like, we like we weren't even sure if it's going to happen to us. But like surprisingly, Li Zhenghui saying that we welcome you to come in and then just sit down and talk. And he just like, he ends this movement peacefully. And which yes. is such a huge, like, it's such a huge opposition to the Tiananmen Square incident. Right. And you have to remember too, like he was going against, like he was going against what's called the royal palace back in the in the government dung. So for him to actually have the courage to sit down with them and say, "Hey, what do you want? You're the people. You're the people. I'm the president. What do you what, what do you want me to do?" 
that was before that never happened. Before the government was like, okay, we're just going to crack down and just call the day. We'll just have, we'll get body bags. But Lee Dunhong actually said, okay, you are Taiwanese. Let's sit down. Let's see what can we do to make the country better. So that's why I have so much love for him for being able, for him to do because that could have ended, that could have ended up if it was someone else. If it was like Hao Bo Chun or Zhang Wei Guo, which is Zhang Jing Guo's uh, leg illegitimate brother, or some or Zhang Shakan, whoever whoever was pro China, it would it would it would it would it would have been deadly. So. Um, we thankfully we had lead down way to lead Taiwan to the right direction at the time because now Taiwan is a vibrant democracy because of what he did at that time. <laughs> yeah, that's why he's called Min Zhu Zhi Fu. Like Yep. D father of democracy. I call him Guo, I call I call him Guo Fu because he is the father. He actually, he's actually yeah, he's actually the father of Taiwan. He's is Sun Yat says is not the father of Taiwan. He's never been to Taiwan ever in his life. Never. Lee Dong Wei was because what Lee Dong Wei did to Taiwan. He's actually the father of Taiwan. Indeed. Yeah, I think we should Ming, like Taiwan's Guo Fu should be Lee Dong Wei. Yes. yes. Not the other person who <laughs> doesn't mean anything to us. Yes. And yes. also like all the pioneers and legends such by fighting for Taiwan democracy. Now we should do like American leaders. We have that like, you have the founding fathers, not just one founding father. I think that's what yes. we do because we got all the pioneers that's been fighting for Taiwan's democracy and under such authoritarian. That's true. That's the reason why Taiwan's democracy is so precious because China wants to take it away. China wants to take it away. And but times people say, oh, we already been through Chinese rule before since 1945. We didn't want to go through that again. That ended in 2000. We didn't want it to go through it again. So it's important for times people to keep fighting for for what they have. And times people are woken up because since 2019, when with thing thing in Hong Kong happens, how people say, wait a minute, we don't want to, we don't want to be like that. We don't be be like Hong Kong. Wait a minute, wait a minute. So times people are more, their eyes are more open. Because of what happened in Hong Kong, what happened with Xi Jinping said, "Hey, we want we want you that we not any consensus is basically the, the one China, one country, two systems. We want you to be under that." And Taiwan people say, "No, uh, not over. We don't want to be part of that." So, oh, I I guess I love this interview with you because I guess that you are also a huge inspiration to us too. Because that you are passionate love for Taiwan is also one thing that keep the Papa moving forward because. Right. Yeah, because I feel like, then you said, Papa has been transitioned to a place where we are so, like you say, Papa's impressive and we are yes. inclusive too. Because we all believe in the same value, which is that protecting the democratic Taiwan. Right, I agree. And, and the mission statement is um, to educate Americans about a free, yeah. independent Taiwan. That's one of the mission statements of FAPA. And I, I and I agree with I agree with that statement all the time because, like, hey, the more that Americans know my Taiwan, the more Taiwan will prosper. And that's it's slowly getting there. It's not what it's not what I wanted. At, what I want to be is that I want what I want to be. I want every American to know about Taiwan like I didn't know Israel because everybody knows about Israel. If you know, they know about Israel. I want I want Taiwan to be on the same level as Israel. Uh, that's, what, that's what I want one day for it to be. Because if you know, with, with every America, they say if Israel's attacked, we're going in. I want the same consensus on Taiwan. That's what I want it to happen because Israel is one of our biggest allies in the world. Taiwan should be in the same level as Israel because without, without Taiwan in, the, in, in Asia, America can't, can't, I mean, America will be gone because you need Taiwan. Ta Taiwan's in the first island chain. Taiwan semiconductor produces 90, I think 90% 90 of all semiconductors in the world, plus it's a democracy. So you want, you don't want to make China take over that because if you take over, China takes over that, then the world's finished. So it's important for America to defend Taiwan, but we have to make it, we have to, we have to emphasize that a lot. We have to make sure that in a way to make sure that America's no the cost and benefits of being allies with Taiwan, defend Taiwan. Wow. I I gotta admit that your knowledge about not just about like you said about Taiwan, what's going on inside Taiwan and the like the relation between Taiwan, the United States and China. You are an expert. <laughs> You're an expert. That's reading. I mean, that's what I'm a I'm a political junkie for Taiwan. And I read, like I said, I read, <laughs> I read, I read twenty articles a day about Taiwan. I listen to Taiwanese podcasts. I um I read articles, start articles all the time. So 
That's how I got the knowledge. But I didn't have this knowledge 12 years ago. It's slowly knowledge that I have getting slowly every year that I keep having. So every year it gets better. So next couple years from now, I'll be even more smarter about Taiwan than I am now because it's all because I because I continue to read about Taiwan every single day to educate myself on what's going on. And also, you also show a good example of like how you like how you try how you figure out the information that you choose that you that the not, I'm not saying like the right information but like correct one that you you have the resources and then you spend time to go out into those information. I feel right. like it's virtue that people nowadays should have, especially like you say you have like Chinese people they are actually fooled and biased by the party yes. education. Right. Right, and while we had the ability to look what we want to look up without being oppressed, we could say, "Okay, let me look up. Let me look up the Taiwan shit right quick. Oh, let me look up. Let me look up the um. Let me look up uh, Chai Ing Wen right quick. Let me look up this and that." We can do that without saying, "Oh, would Uncle Sam come to my door tonight?" Like how because people in China, if they were to research anything about Taiwan that is not from the CCP, they'll get they get arrested. They'll be, they go to prison for about twenty something years. Stuff stuff to that nature. So. As as a as a person who's America, it's important for me to under for me to use my freedoms to 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 do more for Taiwan. Oh, <laughs> would you like to ask some questions, Kusen? Yes. So I feel so overwhelmed by <laughs> the information I have. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it, you you made me think of Li Mingzhe. He has just been yep. released. Yes, yeah. after five years. I I feel like we we have to do something to change the situations, otherwise his sacrifice won't be you know paid or. And here's the thing too: there's many more Li Minjus in China that's being locked away. There's a lot of them, a lot of them that they're, they're not they're not name house name house hold household names, but they're there as well. And the fact and what was and Li and Ming Li Minjia did not do anything wrong. He's basically telling Chinese people about Taiwanese democracy. Yeah. And teaching them the right way about about how I used to be like him. I used to talk to people who I who I was who I was okay with at the time about Taiwan and educating them about it back while I was going to college. But I got older, I realized I can't. I, when I got older, I said I can't be friends with Chinese people because we can't connect. We can't. As you get older, you start to learn a lot of things about yourself about how you sh how you should think. When I was younger, I had the patience to teach Chinese people about Taiwan, but I don't have that patience now because it's like I know what you're gonna say. I know what I'm gonna say. Taiwan is Taiwan. Taiwan's not part of the PRC. Taiwan is should be independent. Should have its own. It should be public of Taiwan. They have a feeling like, oh well, Taiwan should be part of China for the motherland stuff like that. So we can't we can't coexist with each other. So I'm not gonna be that. I can't do that. That I'm 31. Well, I was 24, yeah, but 31 I can't do that because it's a waste of time. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. But I gotta say, yes, like you actually demonstrate a good version of like you respect the freedom of speech at the same time. Yes. You also respect, yeah, that's I feel like that's a good that's the good thing that that's also why we are fighting so hard to protect the democratic Taiwan because we respect the freedom of speech and we have this right to do so, right? Right, and right, for example. I don't like pro China people, but I respect their right to. I respect their right for them to think. I respect their rights to talk. I don't agree what they say. I don't agree with that because our views are different. I advocate for that time. I want you advocate for destroying Taiwan. I don't like your view. I don't respect your view, but I respect the fact that you are a human being that has your own view. I'm not going to hit you or anything like that. I'm not. I'm not a, a radical. You know, what I'm saying I will disagree with you politely and, and move on. That's all I could do. I cannot be. I cannot be around people like that because um it's like we can't we there's no there's no conversation. I can't tell you my view, you can tell me you about your views. You have this view, you have this view, we can't talk and we can't talk and educate and try to educate you about what you have that about your about your fault. So but yeah, but look what happened to the church in uh in Laguna. What look what happened to him. Yeah. Look see, so now Partition Church was a church for Taiwanese people. Remember, back in the 70s, they were instrumental of promoting Taiwanese freedoms and, free, freedoms and stuff like that back in the 70s. They used to, they basically used to protect people who were against the government done back in the day. So for that guy, David, David, I think his name is David Joe, I forgot if I got his name, oh, David Joe. Joe, 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 Joe. Yeah, 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 ye
that's that's his name. That's that's his name. He basically wanted to kill times people because of his political views, and that is disheartening that one person died. But he saved a lot. He saved those people. Rest in peace to him, Mister uh, Doctor Jun. Rest in peace to him. You know, his sacrifice. You know, makes me think every day. Okay, times people are actually dying over over being Taiwanese. And that's so disheartening because it's like times people should be free. They should be have time on these and nothing should happen. Like I'm saying, I'm an American. Nothing should happen. Nothing, nothing will happen to me. Like it, tell you some time people, tell people should I'm, I'm Taiwanese without feeling the repercussions of being who you are. And that's to me so sad that he got shot for being who he who he was. Yeah, that's the story. Wow, <laughs> that's just my. That's also one thing that I mean that as a Taiwanese, I'm mm -hmm. always I, I feel like this back like, back and forth when I was in Taiwan that how to communicate to those people because, like sadly we believe in different country because for those right. people the image of like what country the Taiwan should be like is different from mine, so right. I also feel like this like dilemma when we are trying to approach to the other end of. By people in Taiwan, right? And think about that. Times people didn't read. Times people, you know, they knew they were Taiwanese, but after the nineties, after the 80s, they started saying, "Okay, we're Taiwanese. This is what we have to do to make people know." Because here's the thing: after the eighties, Taiwan was out of Taiwan. It wasn't the UN. Taiwan was actually was actually this orphan in the world that people didn't know about. And it took it took Taiwan decades for people to actually know who Taiwanese people are. Because people, here's the thing, people, where I come from, people, people think that Taiwanese people are Chinese, but it's not, that's not the case. That's because you speak a language, it doesn't mean that you're the same ethnicity. I'm an American, but I'm not Australian or English. Same thing for Taiwanese, Taiwanese people. You speak Zhongwen, but you're not Chinese, you're Taiwanese. And you also speak Taiwanese as well, along with other original languages as well. So it's just disheartening when, for example, I I seen this a lot in my twelve years. I've seen times people who are from Taiwan they call themselves Chinese, and that is so disheartening. I, I used to go when I was going to school, I was going to school for Chinese at my university in Dayton. There was this girl from Elon, Elon, which which is one of the most holy places in Taiwan's democracy. In Elon, said that she was Chinese, and I felt like, why would you call yourself something that you're really not? But I understand, they understand, like, okay, she might call herself that because she's afraid of Chinese people bullying her or threaten her or stuff like that. Because people, Chinese people do get threatened for being who they are. You see, we've seen it recently, like I said before in the previous examples. So yeah, it's not really Chinese people are I, I like I said, I admire Chinese people because despite what you're going through with the bullying and anything else, you still stand strong and say, hey, I'm Taiwanese, this is who I am. I'm not going to surrender my identity over anything else. <laughs> You are a uh, Taiwan Taiwan warrior. <laughs> you know what? The Famosan bear has that, that the little white boomerang, yeah. and what that and what that means. I was what that means is warrior. So the Famosan bear is a warrior. So Taiwanese people, because that's the spirit of Taiwan. It's a Famosan black bear. So wow. <laughs> 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 Again, I'm impressed by you. <laughs> Taiwan and boomerang on the Taiwan bear. I think that's a. I have, I have, I have as a tattoo. So when I told my tattoo artist about that, he loved it. He said, "Oh, I never seen this animal before. What is the? What does that mean? He never seen a bear with that ever. He he loved it. He was just said, oh, this is. I love this. What is this called? Called the bear. And he said, "Oh, okay. I love it. So he he enjoyed doing that. So. Oh, that's good. So question for you, when's that yearbook coming out? Is it coming out um in September? Yeah, it's going to be like distributed and uh, published. Uh, well distributed actually during uh, uh dinner, the banquet event. How many people have you interviewed so far for the for the yearbook? Well, I mean, A besides lot? in the most of men they actually submit their write up. So they write us their story and submit some photos. Well, actually for you, you can do that too. Like you can just like give us some photos because we will be looking forward to the photos that you have with the local British friends team. I got it. I got a lot of pictures I got sent anyway. I sent chewing a lot of pictures and I sent I used to, and with chewing, I sent a lot of pictures. I said, hey, this is a picture I want. I said, oh, I had to give her five pictures. So I feel bad because I used to email. I said, oh, use this picture. Use this picture. I said, oh no, use this one. <laughs> 
I was like, oh no. So I'm gonna send you the final five later. That way, he said this is something that I want to be in a yearbook because I felt bad for her. I said, but I was just so excited because this is such an honor to be part of Papa's history. Because me being where I come from and be blue who I am, it's such an honor to be part of this beautiful tradition of Papa history from the 1980s to now. So I was like, I was excited. I'm so excited because I can't wait to get the book, actually read other people's stories about how they became Papa. I tried to, I said, I told you, I said, Janice, you have, I told you, I said, Janice, you have to give you have to give them i told her i said you had to put your you gotta, you gotta put your name in it too I'm, so I'm trying to tell her hey submit to course that's immediately that way you're in the book as well she said oh well you know what i say blaze do that way you're in there as well <laughs> yeah this sounds pretty generous <laughs> yeah that's her she said oh i'll do it i'm like she said now i said i will i will be more than happy to look over and correct it for you if you like that way we could give it to fampa mm. so Oh well, yeah, we we definitely look forward to your pictures, and then yeah, because now we will transcribe this interview, and then we will send the first job to you to see now how would you like it, and then you can decide send some of the photos too, and then in the end we'll put it in a book. My, I bet I bet I have like ten pages for my chapter. I had like ten pages. I gave you so much information, like I gave from the last interview to this one. I gave you like ten pages of information, so I feel bad for the people who. Cause I'm a talker, cause I love Taiwan so much. I'm so passionate about Taiwan. My part is probably ten pages long compared to anyone else's. Cause they about so you know I was, you know, but me is like oh my page, my is basically a chapter, which is <laughs> yes. like oh man. And you, uh, also the the brief history, the brief like lecture of Taiwan history too. Taiwan history of democracy progress. Yeah, that's the most important thing. So yeah, <laughs> so I'm in. I know. I know that my part will be huge. So hopefully um, we can get the most important parts out of it. That way you get more people to be in it because that's going to be a big book because you have a lot of members who, you know, is in FAMPA. And it's nice. It's actually interesting that we actually see those people that through our generation. We have the one that fall, like, fall in the 80, in the 90. We oh. also have people like you fall in the 20, like 20, 20, 20, starting from 2010 to 2020. So we actually said, like, I like that. It's actually I feel like that's why we call the book the path to the future because we actually went the path, and now we are looking forward to the future. And like I say, that we are trying to like transition to Papa 2.0. And that's the most important part. It's gonna take us to be able to do it. I, we could do it because we have we have really we have very very intelligent people in Papa who are who are young and old, and for us younger people, it's up to us to be able to make sure Papa exists. Even when we're older, because we by the time we're their age, we I want to see a new generation that takes over our spots when when we get to their when we get to their that's that's that's, that's the most important part right now is make sure that we do what we can now to grow the seeds of success, and then when it gets when we get older in the, in our eighties and seventies and eighties when we get a little bit older, the young generation will keep on the path that we set up for them. So this is basically a passion the torch, if you will. So. Yeah, like yes, exactly. It's like a passionate tour. And I love I love this idea. Because my reading I just got on board this in June and I feel like I'm so inspired by reading those pieces and then also having this interview with you. Cause it's that this is why we I chose to join Papa because events in Taiwan has been the goal and then seeing that this is not a country that in around the world should deserve the treatment needs from another right. country. Right. I mean, besides Taiwan, I mean, there's not too many countries you'd be advocate for. I mean, you could be advocate for Israel, Palestine, but that's basically it. Taiwan, that's the reason why we are basically fighting for a country's existence. That's usually why the, sh the burden is bigger than compare. If, for example, people could argue about abortion. That's a, the abortion, um, uh, borders, um, taxes, all those stuff, but it's domestic. We basically all go against an international bully in China. So our burden for us to do it is a lot more heavy to people who's in those domestic issues. So we have to be, we have to make sure that we all united for Taiwan. Because if we're not, Taiwan doesn't have a future. Because without Papa, Taiwan won't be here today. So. Mm. Oh, <laughs> thank you for that remark. It's really nice. And then to have, me that, have you say that, let us feel more inspired to do the, to continue doing the thing that we are doing. Yeah, I mean, you have to, you know, like I said, FAPA is an excellent, is an excellent, you know, um, 
um, pool to advocate for because there's a lot of chapters around the country. You also, you know, even though some chapters are not bigger bigger than other chapters, but if you can make impact, that's all you need. You just need one person to make an impact, and then you got a good you got a good organization. So, people who are around, all the members who are who are over three thousand members who are in FAPA, they, have a, they are making change by being an organization that cares about Taiwan. I feel I uh, review a lot of Taiwan lessons, Taiwan history lessons. <laughs> and Papa <laughs> history too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I like, feel refreshed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I mean, Taiwan, Taiwan's, Taiwan's not, history is not really, people don't know not, not a lot about it. They just think Taiwan history began at 1949, but that's not the case. Taiwan existed since the 1600s. So it's like, there's some history that people don't know about Taiwan because they get in one fact of the history. They're not getting the other half that was before 1945 so it just yeah this guy that's what we gotta emphasize if we got if we got when we when you do do the social media community we have to emphasize we gotta do like a segment of Taiwan's history we got we have to do that we have to make sure oh, that, yeah. what happened what happened on this day what was you know what is what happened on this day what is that that way they people know oh okay people are knowing more about history about Taiwan not going down history but real Taiwanese history about the struggles of democracy before the Japanese period stuff like that that way they don't know that's what we need. That's what we need to do. Is history is your best friend because it basically teaches you about what happened and what stuff like that. Well, yeah. There's a calendar uh, in Taiwan. I, I when I um I went back to Taiwan last year, year end, and there's a calendar special design. Just as you said, there's a, like every day what happened in the history, uh, who right. got killed or, or something significant right. happened. I tried to right. bring back, but it is too heavy. This this is this thick, so I was like, right. okay. <laughs> yeah, if we could do something similar to that, that'd be wonderful. Because people, here's the thing: a lot of things in Taiwan are, are are Chinese. A lot of people in America don't know Chinese. So if we can make them to English and teach and teach them about it, that would be a wonderful tool to have. That way, we educate them about Taiwanese history from a Taiwanese perspective. From a Taiwanese perspective, so. Well, is is it, uh, is it actually a very nice suggestion? Because I have the arranged the same issue. When I was talking to my friend american friends from school they'll be like okay i know you guys study after like 1949 okay mm -hmm. no no i wonder my grandparents that they were they were born during the japan uh, the japan colonization but i don't even i don't know myself it was not yeah, I was like the immigrant kind so i'll be like no no, no that's not the Taiwan history Taiwan history is way longer and more and richer than it Yes, and you had a lot of aboriginals at the time as well. Because remember, back in the day, people the, like the Dutch people, they didn't want to go to Taiwan because they knew the headhunters were there too. They know yeah. if you set foot in Taiwan, you're gonna die. Because remember, Taiwan was basically with a with a with aboriginal people until until you got the Europeans that came in there and they introduced Christianity and anything else. And then when the Japanese came later, they install like hygiene, they install, you know, like hygiene, clothing, anything else that made Taiwan a, a modernized uh, colony at the time. Here's the crazy thing. After the Japanese left Taiwan, Taiwan's economy was bigger than the entire continent of China at that time. The, just imagine that. A country smaller than China economy was bigger than China at that time. It was more richer, more resourceful. And when, like I said, so, but people don't, people don't know that either people didn't know like people also thought that times people weren't fighting against the japanese either they were but it wasn't big you had you had like you had the home you had the home movement where Taiwanese legislatures were demand that they had representation in the national diet in japan you know they, they, they don't know that so so yeah it's important that we teach them because if papa could be able to because papa it's for basically all times people in their interest. So if they can just emphasize the history part and the social part of, of Taiwan and English, Americans will be more interested. They say, Oh, I didn't know about it. Let me go, let me go and let me go buy some books on Taiwan on Amazon and make some think. We also recommend I make a Tuesday. I recommend we do like a book of the month for Taiwan. A book, oh, a book, like a book that you know, either by 
it, 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 could be, it, could be, it could be like Green Island. It could be a movie. It could be something that we rec- It could be a scholarly book. It could be something that we could recommend that people will either read or either watch. I also recommend that we sh- like we share like we also recommend that we share more English articles on Taiwan too that are read by scholars too. That way, that way, you know, they that way it's more. We, we just need the this the game is information. We are in an information war against China. We need to have more information than them about Taiwan. We can't have them. Create a narrative on Taiwan. We have to create a narrative ourselves. So that's what you have to do, like the history, the book of the month, um, you know, anything else. That way, we give it more people, more resources to know about Taiwan who don't know Chinese at all or or Taiwanese at all. The language. Yeah, and then you actually point out a pretty important part where now we have to shape our own narrative. Now that China controls this narrative, and then to worry others with the wrong information. Because here's the, because here's the thing, okay, China spends about seven billion dollars a year on propaganda from Xinhua to CCTV to G G G G. I think it's called GCT. I forgot what their low English channel. I forgot what it's called. They spend all that money, and what they talk about English about Taiwan being part of China. So we can't beat oh. seven billion. However, we can beat truth by being by giving people these resources. Say, hey, this is the resource that you need for Taiwan. This is what this is what we have to do. That mm-hmm. way. That way they get in both sides. So, okay, they, they can be said, wait, this is this Taiwan's different from, from what China says. So that's the reason why I recommend those ideas. That way we can, you know, that way more people can understand about Taiwan from our view, you know, like I said before. Great idea. Yeah, I would def- we'll definitely like, put into our to-do list. <laughs> yes. I feel like after this interview, because then I got a lot of ideas and then how we can incorporate that. Because we've been talking about how we can very shape our, like to reshape the thing that we are doing. And then I like, guess so to shift gear to more like to educate the younger public in the, in the United States. Yes, that's important because if you advocate, because like I said, young people are more susceptible to information. They will they will research it and accept it as soon as they find out more about it. So if we can get the young people to be more involved, you you have more times people getting involved. Say okay, this, okay, this, this okay, this is something I could get behind, and that's how that's how it should be. So, but yeah, what's your to do list for FOP? I want to hear that list. I'm curious about what that list is because you have a big to do <laughs> list. Yeah, because like what we, like I can say, like I just like, I just will say I noticed the increase for like first I want to we want to approach the Taiwanese student who came to the United States to study. Because right. like we realized that this actually sort of like the Taiwan knowledge gap between the like, right. people who actually talk uh, study particle science and people right. who do not. So we do want to raise the awareness among right. Because right. you are from Taiwan, but how you come here, but you have this like gap in terms of like Taiwan. Right. And they will be like, okay, we got to merge that gap first. And at the same time, when we're doing that, we're also trying to approach to the young, like the American public here. Too. Right, 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 right. And that task is difficult, but it can be achieved if you keep our perseverance. You gotta keep it. You gotta do it slowly. You can't rush to it. You gotta build. You gotta build it up because people, times people that come to America to study to study political science or any other major, um, in America, they will first understand that politics is everything. Politics is no matter if you pay taxes, no matter what you do, anything is political. I don't care what anybody says. Anything is a political process. So no matter what they do. Politics will always be with them no matter what. So they might as well understand it, read about it, and then get involved. But it's a slow process that they have to understand that, 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 that process for, for them to be able to really grasp, the, grasp what it means to do advocacy for Taiwan. Because, like I said, in Taiwan, I mean, they don't they, they, they don't do advocacy work. I mean, there's 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 some people that do it in Taiwan, but for them to come to America to actually learn, yes. they get what they learn in America, they could bring back to Taiwan and be a better advocate over in Taiwan, and you know, help their leg their legislature and their in their city councilman and mayor to do more for Taiwan. Yeah. So, and that's the important skill to have. Mm, yeah, that's what that's what we are trying to do because. Uh, I mean, sadly, that I have a friend that who would be a little, who would be pretty standoffish or like indifferent about the political environment in Taiwan. And then we approach and we'll be like, 
I mean, I still find it offensive when they still call China manly. I'm like, okay, you do not know what does the word manly mean, right? Right. But it's, it's kind of sad to see that when I was in Taiwan to see some of my friends still refer to uh, refer China as manly. I'm like, manly, oh, I hate we that. We gotta change that. We gotta change from that first. I hate that jungle dalu. I hate that. I, <laughs> when I was when I was younger, I used to use it because I, I watched a lot of Taiwanese news that said it a lot. But then when I got older, I said, "Wait a minute! When you said jungle dalu, you basically agreeing with China that Taiwan's part of China. That's not. That's yeah. not. No, that's not. Yeah. So, but a lot of old people say because they grew up. They grew up on that. But younger people, I'm seeing it less. I'm seeing a little bit less than I said like. Years ago, I'm seeing a little bit of people say, oh, we can't call it Dalu because Dalu means that China is our motherland, but that's not true. So I agree with that premise 100%. And it, that's exactly the idea that how I tell the Taiwanese who study here, I'll be like, you go to Puerto Rico, they refer to America as they refer to like the continent as mainland. But you, like, if we know that Puerto Rico is like the, ter- the territory of the United States, Right. Taiwan, that you know Taiwan's independent country, how will you refer your the other country as your mainland if you got the like, same concept from Puerto Rico and the United States? That's true. Also, to always tell people this all the time as well, it's like Taiwan is not part of China because here's here's how you know it's not part of China. Do you pay tax to Beijing? You do not. You, <laughs> you, you pay you pay it to Taipei. Oh. You pay. Do do you when you go to out of the country, even though the passport says Republic of China in Chinese, which I hate that. That should be ch- that needs to be changed in the future. Hope, 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 hope before I die, I'll see Republic of Taiwan. So that's my biggest goal. Hope to see that. But when you apply for a uh, top, when you apply for when you go to America as a Taiwanese, you don't need a visa. If you're Chinese, you need a visa to go to, go to America. If you're Chinese, <laughs> that's the second thing. The third thing too is like when you third thing as well. Chinese people they they when they speak is a different accent. They said, Thai people, they speak, they say, they say, oh, 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 <laughs> and, and, and I, and I, so that's how I, oh, that's a person's Taiwanese, that's, that's how I know, that's how I know they're Taiwanese, because that's, that's how I know they're Taiwanese, that's how I know, so that's how you know the difference, so it's like, when you say Dalu, it's basically telling that, it's not true, how can, how can it be true, how can, plus two, I also said the flag rule as well, at Zhong Tong Fu, you don't see that red, start flag on Taiwan. You don't see that at all. So it's like when I see a flag, when I'm in Columbus, I see the American flag, Ohio flag. I see those two things because I know America's part, Ohio's part of America. I see the two flags right there. I see it right there. I see it. In Taiwan, I don't see that. So even I don't see that at all. So it's like it's not true. So but a lot of people don't think that way. So wow. <laughs> I got it. I gotta say that I gotta invite you to every single workshop or meetup that Jose and I host. <laughs> I'll, I'll <laughs> tell. Yeah, you will be our strongest like, online guest. I'll be like, okay, I brought you the expert. <laughs> they look at me like, who is him? Is he a, is he a congressman? <laughs> will be. You will be, a, you will be like, like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That's, that's going to be the tag that we make you. Please do. When you do, please do. On um, like, go to those merchants. Have that on there. Have that on there. Go make watch it. Have that on there. That way, people say, "Oh, who, oh, we know who he is now." <laughs> yeah, we got. We have to like give you like a word, like Gumi Wai Jiao Guan award, and you can <laughs> bring that with you. You know, I remember like for the board meeting play that we met each year. Oh, we should make you one. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 yeah, make me one. That way, I can have it in September because um, with the emerging leaders, I think I can speak. I think I can speak to the young people. I think I can speak in a way that they understand. I talk for about five minutes. And say, hey, this is what we have to do. You know, what I'm saying this is this is a mission. This is a marathon. This isn't a sprint. I have to, so have me talk at the have me talk for five minutes with the with the young leaders in September. I'll be more than happy to sit down and talk and say, hey, this is what we have to do. <laughs> Yeah, that would be fun. No, definitely. But I would, I would definitely bring this up. I'll definitely bring this up during our meeting because I'll be like, well, you know why I get an interesting speaker that wouldn't. I'm pretty sure all the participants will stay awake. <laughs> yeah, they will because it's, it's a little bit different. You know, I'm a different type of person, so they'll stay awake for that. So I tell them, say, hey, you know, we have to, we have to, you know, 
Because I mean, we we could do a we could do a merger leaders. You have to get people who been who know what to do, who's been through it. You know, that's why you could get me, yeah. get Janice, get who get whoever who's young to speak to the people. That way, they say, "Oh, okay, this is this isn't so I'm so I'm not alone." Because when you when you first do advocacy, I learned in 2020 through FOMP. I learned that it's it, I mean it's the art, and you learn the art by by being involved in it. And as soon as you get the art down. It becomes second nature to you. Yes. Wow, that's true. That's true. And then, can I the goal for emerging leaders also like to educate younger generation to be the best advocate for Taiwan, and then to have someone like you who actually going through that path and still on the way on the path, and then actually you said like give the evidence, like a testimony for them to learn about what it's like to advocate for Taiwan. Yeah, that's true. Because I could tell them, "Hey, I've been to the FAPA workshop online for two years. I'm, I'm that will resonate with them because they're, oh, he did this before. He actually got, he actually talked to Congress people. He actually talked to um these aides. He actually knows what he's talking about. He actually researched what he talks about. So it bring, it'll make them aware of that. And that's and that and they're like, okay, they'd be inspired. Because a lot of people that talk to me on Twitter say, oh, Naj, because of you." And what you do for Taiwan, I'm inspired to, to love Taiwan more. I get that sometimes. So I'm like, oh, okay, that's real good. You know, that's real, real good. You know, I'm just be able to just be able to tap, tap times people say, hey, man, it's I said, I'm not Taiwanese by blood, I'm in spirit, but I stand with you. I'm gonna do what I do for you. Let me show you who I am. And then a resident will say, okay, he's really about what he's about. So. Just tell tell means that I like I like to talk with the young people. Tell means that I think he'd be okay with that because I I mean I am I do do a lot for Fapa, humbly. So yeah, just tell him, hey, I'll be more than happy to speak with them. Yeah, definitely. We will definitely bring this up because I believe you love this idea. I believe you will love this idea. It's our honor to have you as a guest speaker too. It's our honor to have you and then to tell those participants what it's like that too. Because you actually say you. What you are doing is by putting what they learn in the workshop into practice. Right. That's true. I mean, plus two, I mean, plus two, you know, I can sit, I can basically with them, I can say um, to them, mm. you not alone in this situation. Top FAPA is a big organization. And if they see that you really love Taiwan, they'll, they'll help you. Cause I got help. I got help. I got Janice helped me out on day one. I'd be a good advocate when I went in FAPA after, in 2020 when we started doing those workshops back in the day. So she helped me. I become who I am today. I help her. I thank her for that so much for that. So I says, I says, so if anybody will help, will help you out to, to get on your feet to become better. So they'll, they'll, they'll they, this, 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 this need, this need a real, like I said, they need a real testimony on who that person is. And that's a good thing. Yes. We love this. I'll show them my tattoos. Say, hey, I got 28 tattoos on my body. They'll, they'll, they'll like that. They're like, oh, they'll like, they'll like that. They're like, oh, okay. <laughs> and probably also need to give them your tattoo artist contact info. But if, okay, I won't have <laughs> one now. Uh, yeah, I'll do that. That's what we, I'll do that. And it will take photo with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, this... And then you will be, like, you will be cooking on the social medias again. <laughs> If I do, I'll say, you know what? I think I, I said, Pop, I said, I'll tell people, I said, Papa gave me this opportunity. So thank, I thank them first of all. I thank myself. So, so. Oh, it is so nice. It's so nice to have you. And thank you for like saying yes to this second interview because you got, you, I gotta say, interview the second time inspired me even more because like the first time is more like to get to know how you came to Papa and your path. But now it's like knowing your past forward, be like, okay, it's pretty inspiring now how you how you transform your path from the energy that you gather from your past experience. And that's important because I mean I got three principles. Taiwan Sidrip, Taiwan Substance from Taiwan's people, show who Taiwan, protect Taiwan, and Kang Jong Bao Bao Tai. Basically against the CCP and protect Taiwan. Those are the three principles that I live every day. I have, I have those on my body because I live by those principles. And that's what keeps me going. It's those three principles of those of those important values that I hold dear to me. That's on my body, on my arms. So that's what keeps me on my path to success for Taiwan. So oh the 
next. Okay, after this interview, the first thing I'm going to do is not to tell Minza about your spirit, but tell my dad about you. <laughs> yeah, I think Minza. I think Minza knows a little bit about me. He knows that there's a there's an advocate in Ohio and Cincinnati who who is who is um who's you know real passionate about. He I think he knows a little bit about me because I think not too much, but I think he knows a little about me. <laughs> And yeah, already quite famous in the Papa community. Yes, <laughs> I really, everybody, I, I gotta, I gotta get a sense that everybody knows you. <laughs> they do. And aren't you having a a, a, a online Papa thing on July the 9th? About yeah, July ninth. Oh, are you? Can you? Probably you can. Janice can do the chapter story showcase. Ask. I'll ask her about that. I'll see what she's doing on that day because you know her. She usually busy with her with her over or, or, or who are doing some or doing something. So she has so. teaching and a performance. She's pretty oh, busy. I so I'll ask her. I'll ask her because I mean I'll ask her if she wants to do that. Um, because I mean that'd be great because me and her, like I said, we have chemistry because we do a lot of advocacy things together. So I think she'd be perfect. But like I said, it depends on what she's doing on that take. Cause she's a she's a real busy body, which is good. I mean, she's always like that. So I her to schedule us in and then rearrange the schedule with the students. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm gonna ask her about this. Hey, come with me, come with me on July 9th. That way we could do a showcase together. Come on. I'll, I'll, I'll ask her. Yeah, I love it. Yes. And it could be your first photo down. So like you would get a better one for the book. But okay, we can leave this for the showcase and we can keep the good ones for the book. Yeah, I, 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 I ask her about that because, you know, I think that because, like I said, Janice has been a godsend to me because who she is. I mean, she's a, you know, thanks to her, I was able to see the ambassador because in the beginning of that, I wasn't because she told me about the event a couple months beforehand. But it's usually it, the select Ohio, select Taiwan and the, and the, and the Ohio Taiwan, Taiwan caucus, I was basically supposed to be in March. However, it was pushed back to April. I could go in March because I was so busy at my job, but I went in April because I was able to get off of that, on that one day. So I thank Janice for doing it because without her, I wouldn't be able to meet the ambassador. So I thank her every, every day for that because I wouldn't. That's why, I, like I said, that's why that's why I call her my, my advocacy buddy because, like I said, we do a lot of things. We do a lot of things for each other when it comes to Taiwan. So. And that's the one. That's definitely, that just like let Janice know, and we'll look forward to my showcase because it will be so great. And then, like it's time for it. I mean, like different from September one, the July one, we plan to have more like family gathering. Mm -hmm. So it will be great that to have the chapters to show the chapter story about like Papa journey, and like to do the introduction to the to the whole the entire Papa community about the story and past. Right. And then September, I can't wait for September because I told okay. Janice, I said, September is going to be a fun, will be fun because I, for me to go to Major League, for us to go to Twin Oaks, Twin Oaks, that's a, that's a, I heard about Twin Oaks was out when I was young. I said, oh, for me to actually go there. I'm like, that, that would be an honor for me to actually go there. I'm like, oh, wow. To be actually to go there and see history, that would be interesting. So yes. I want that. Yeah, you should. And then I you will. should, and you should definitely like, Stay with us from the first day of the emergent leader. <laughs> I will. I'll be there. <laughs> so the entire emergent leaders, along with um, along with the national conference, that's basically over a week event. Is that correct? Yes. And okay, that's so, perfect. Perfect. Okay. And then so perfect. on Saturday would be that like banquet. So on the on the Saturday would be like we do twin elves, and then evening we do the banquet celebration. Okay, I do see the form online, so I'll go ahead and fill that. I'll go ahead and fill, fill, fill it out. That way you'll have it. That way um you'll have it before Ju before July 10th as well. Oh, that would be great. Well, look forward to like, having you. And then you can definitely there. ask Dennis for your like, help for recommendation. <laughs> or say that Dennis, see how her, just see how he write this. <laughs> Yeah, I'm gonna I'm ask her for see what she's up to on that day, July 9th. Is it, is it in person or is it online, that event on July 9th? Oh, uh, July 9th one will be online. Okay, perfect. Okay, press work. Okay, I just want to make sure about that. Let's make sure. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, the July 9th will be online. But for the whole September, the entire September, that week would be in person. In person, which I can't wait for. I can't wait for that. So hopefully a lot of, hopefully a lot of young people, hopefully a lot of people come. I yeah, so. it will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you there in the September wait. event. I, yes. I can't wait to go too. I can't wait to go as well. Can't wait for that. It's gonna be fun. And we can't wait to like count those tattoos on your body and then to see that. 28. 
28 of them so far on this base yeah. 28 28 of, on my body here that I'm, that I'm proud of on my body because it's my tattoos represents my commitment to taiwan so and i'm and I, I get like one a month because i make a lot of make a lot of money at my job so i get one a month that for taiwan and i'm and by the end uh by the end of next by the end of next year this arm will be filled up for taiwan as well i have like you know a couple like this stem right here that's that's basically the abortion stem for the for the top people basically on the boats and and and, and, and um and tai dong it's on the boats for the abortion people over there so i got yeah. this symbol be, be, because i love this one i love what it represents too so i got i got this recently so wow. I really, I really love it. we we just i just see that we can't wait to hear you telling us all the all the stories when we actually meet and we can't, can't wait. wait for that I can't wait. Like a couple months, like we so got a couple months away. We got like basically three months to go. So yeah. All right. So yeah, can't wait for that's gonna be real fun for a but for to see both of you there. So and like I said, of course, says um, my uh five hundred ends in in August. Let's keep on t keep on taking up the hundred every month. That way, Papa can okay. be helped. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your help. Feel yeah. so supportive. <laughs> yeah. So. I'll work harder then. I'll, <laughs> I won't let you down. <laughs> yeah, we right. won't let you down. You are, I know you won't. That your, your experience and your passion for Taiwan, I gotta say, it's besides our love for Taiwan, your story is what keeps us going to. I mean, I'm just one piece of Papa. I mean, I'm just, I'm very humble. I'm one piece of Papa. I mean, a lot of people, there's like, Papa's like a puzzle. Everybody has put in time for Papa. People come from all different backgrounds for Papa to be this big puzzle. So I'm just a part of the puzzle that I am right now, but I'm happy to be a piece that is needed in Papa. That's what, that's what, because with a puzzle, you have to, you have to have pieces to complete it. So I'm happy to be one of those pieces that, hey, we need to be, we need, we need you to complete it. A lot of organizations are not like that. Especially those bigger ones. So for me to be able to have the impact now, it's 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 such an honor. So, thank you. Thank well, you. I have more impulse to work at Papa now. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's right. I mean, hey, Papa's a hard a hard job to do, but for you to be able to do it, that's it's basically that you know how much you care about you love your country. Because a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people with Taiwan people either love Taiwan, don't love Taiwan. You love it. So for you to be able to do action by you working there, you just you make it a big difference already. And let me tell you something, of course. But every time you do those little every after every year that you do every after every December we do the whole board meeting, the way you go over those numbers for fundraising, I'm impressed. I can't do numbers like how you do. I like how you sit there and say this equals this number, this equals that number. We did right this much last year. The equation to five is this. I'm like, I don't know any of this numbers here. Let me get my notebook out and learn from Corsetsk because I was I'm I was math wasn't my strong subject in school, but every time I listen to yourself, let me write this down. Let me how did she get this number? How did she get the ten thousand dollars? What was the math in that? All that she's a master, she's definitely a master. The idea we're actually like going through a job, but how oh, could you just tell me this was in two seconds? Like, how you sort it out? She's a master. I gotta say she's, she's impressive. A I can't I rehearse a lot of time in my place. <laughs> You do, it so so you do it so you. flawless, though. I'm like, how did oh. she do that? I'm like, because I'm, so like, I'm like, the way you go over it, the way you, people ask you, Michelle, okay, Chris, how did you get this number? Should we lower this number? You say, well, this according to this, my state here, I'm like, oh, man, she knows what she's talking about. Uh, well, I, I have stomach ache every time before the presentation. <laughs> You, it's okay. I mean, you stu you have to stumble to be successful. So it's okay that you stumble because after every board meeting that you that you did every year, I mean, it's been flawless because everybody knows how much money Papa has. So I, I, it's 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 glad that I hear that. Um, but I hope that next time I can um express in a much clearer way so you can everyone can understand what I'm saying. <laughs> I know there was a lot of information there, so yeah, I'll definitely make it more streamlined and more simple for for I you mean, <laughs> I, mean, I mean i mean it's this process and you'll get better at it every, every time you do it you get better at it because i mean you, you go do it again this year so you go you go, you go like okay this is, let me say it a different way and you're going to do it so yeah, let me know how, how i can improve in this uh, area <laughs> listen 
Listen, my math is not good as yours. I only thing I see on there is, is, is dollar signs and equations. The only thing I see was that I don't see. I don't know how you got the numbers. I don't know how you got the ten thousand. I don't know. I don't know how you got that equation. I don't know how you got it. So that's why I learned from you. It's okay. How did she get that? Let me write. How did she get to that that number? How did she quantify it? All that. So. No, it's also with the help of our outsource CPA. So not all, it's a joint effort. So yeah. <laughs> but you present yeah. it. But you, the way you present it is golden. The way you present it. So I just want to let you know that. I told I tell Janice all the time. I said Janice, the way Corsair does it, I can't see no one else but Corsair is doing that presentation. But her, I can't see it. She's a professional auditor. I feel like I'm very very small in front of her. <laughs> so she's real. Like she's a. Yeah, she's humble. You know, she's real humble. She know she's real humble about that. You know that. But for you to be able to do it, it's impressive. I mean, you know, there's a committee that does it too, but they trust you to do it. So it means that they believe in you. So thank you. I feel more and more encouraging <laughs> doing this. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I feel. Yeah, I, 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 you. thank you. Yeah, you, you could make any suggestion or like so I can also improve every year. So that, that you're doing be better. Helpful. You're doing you were more confident last time at 21. So just keep you on just keep. Yeah, were you there? there? I, I, I was online. That's how I here's that's how I found that I was online because Janice invited me to that. Every I went, I went, I went, I did online last year. I did online 2020. That's how I know. Because I sit there and listen. I'm like, okay, I sit there, okay, let's let's sit there and watch what happens with this board with this board meeting. Then that's how I know. 